My name is Stephen Hawking. I have devoted my life to study, teaching, and research in the field of cosmology, astrophysics, and mathematics in an attempt to understand the most fundamental questions that have faced mankind since the dawn of time. During the course of my work, I have been fortunate to have worked with talented people, and in doing so, have led many projects and developed theories that have helped us better understand the world and universe around us. The Stephen Hawking Foundation exists to ensure that there were any problems and unanswered questions, probably by scientists who are currently young children, or even not yet born. I have been fortunate that despite my physical disability, I have been able to work but I am conscious that there are all sorts of different disabilities that people suffer from. I believe that where there is life there is hope. So I will continue working for as long as I can. And I hope you will join me on this journey.
being here at the Maths Faculty in Cambridge with some of the most famous physicists in the world is, is absolutely amazing. Every day I, I come here and I see those amazing buildings. Somehow it, it sort of radiates knowledge. No matter what you want to think about, you've got someone who's a world expert to talk to. Yeah, Stephen Hawking is definitely a draw. Whenever he comes in, it never gets old. It's always still quite exciting when he comes into the department. Of, of course it's been amazing to see Stephen Hawking close up over so many years. But more than that, of course, he's a singular individual. You know, he's, he's an inspiration to everyone. But one of his mottos is never give up. The biggest and most interesting thing is the whole universe. How does the whole universe work? How does it really fit together? What's the sort of the clockwork behind it that makes it run the way it does? Curiosity is essential to being human. From the dawn of humanity, we've looked up at the stars and wondered about the universe around us. My Cosmos group is working to understand how space and time work from before the first trillion trillions of a second after the Big Bang up to today, 14 billion years later. The Cosmos group focuses on the most extreme events in the universe. Uh, when the basic fabric of space and time is shaken up. We are searching for tiny signatures in huge data sets to find clues that will unlock the secrets of the early universe and of black holes. Without computers, what we do now would be impossible. Now, the data sets are getting so big, there's so much information. Some of these data sets are, are, are billions and billions of galaxies. In both cosmology and in relativity, we face this deluge of new data that presents us with a lot of challenges computationally. So we were pleased when uh, HPE was able to bring many more resources to in-memory computing. In-memory computing definitely helps us to do this a lot easier because it enables us to test our algorithms quickly and easily. I mean, it's, it's the perfect system for me. It's, it's almost designed specifically for my work. It's so flexible. It allows you to ingest very large data sets and act on them immediately. It allows you to try out new ideas, new algorithms, to innovate and develop your codes faster. So it gives us a competitive edge in a very fast-moving field. Academia is, is a fiercely competitive industry. For you to stay ahead of everyone else, you've got to be pushing the boundaries. Having the right architecture behind you and the right systems behind you is a really key part of that. We work hand in hand with the scientists, getting a new system to help them even further in their, in their scientific endeavors is, is just fantastic. The first ever direct detection of gravitational waves announced last year caught me by surprise because I did not expect it so soon. The signal found by the LIGO experiment of two merging black holes marks the dawn of a new era of gravitational wave astronomy. It was really big news. <laughs> yeah, it opens up a completely new field. A billion years ago, two black holes in a distant galaxy, they merged together. The gravitational effect of this was so strong that it actually created these ripples in space-time. The gravitational waves traveled through the universe. Then we measured those gravitational waves in our detectors, and we could predict the signal precisely. We've done very theoretical research for a very long time, and we can now suddenly take all of our theories, take all of our computer simulations, etc., and look at the data on the fly and compare them to reality. I mean, this is what we want to do as physicists. Within memory computing, we can keep up with the flood of new data, and we can keep ahead because we are free to innovate. It allows us to do bigger simulations, more accurate simulations, and to really test our theory at a tighter and tighter level. So that's where shared memory computing really is, is the key advantage for us. Whip up a code, no matter how weird or complicated the idea is, you don't have to worry about how much memory you use doing that, and you get some idea of whether your idea e even works. It's great because we can get students who, with a minimal amount of programming introduction, can actually use the system and do large-scale problems and get solutions. The field is moving too fast to wait until we are all advanced programmers. We want to be focusing on the science and on the discovery and testing our ideas. The universe really is the ultimate laboratory for testing our ambitious ideas about the fundamental building blocks of matter and of space and time.
You know, and there's not that many huge mysteries left in, in science out there. And we're really at a living in a time where we, we should get them. But this higher precision science and our complex theories will only be able to confront each other using powerful computers. Without supercomputers, we would just be philosophers.
to shine a light on our ever-expanding universe. Nothing can escape a black hole, not even light. Discovery have teamed up with the Stephen Hawking Center at Cambridge University. Just like a car, star will also run out of fuel. Relativity investigated, dark matter untangled, and black holes revealed. If a person was to fall into a black hole, they would end up really, really stretched. Universe Unraveled with the Stephen Hawking Center.
to shine a light on our ever-expanding universe. Nothing can escape a black hole, not even light. Discovery have teamed up with the Stephen Hawking Center at Cambridge University. Just like a car, a star will also run out of fuel. Relativity investigated, dark matter untangled, and black holes revealed. If a person was to fall into a black hole, they would end up really, really stretched. Universe Unraveled with the Stephen Hawking Center. Good evening and welcome to these public lectures in celebration of Stephen Hawking's birthday. I'm Anne Davis. I'm here to guide you through the event. We are very pleased to have distinguished speakers with us, Professor Sir Roger Penrose and Professor Achiro Komatsu, who are going to offer us some insights about the Big Bang and black holes. But they'll be formally introduced later. This event is being organised by the Stephen Hawking Centre for Theoretical Cosmology, which is part of the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. Um, the centre is known as CTC for short. Stephen founded CTC in 2007 thanks to a generous benefaction from the Avery Sue Foundation. His goal was to develop theories of the universe which are both mathematically consistent and observationally testable. We're organizing this event together with our cosmology colleagues in Munich as part of the strategic partnership between Cambridge and the Ludwig Maximilian University, or LMU for short. Um, this public event marks the end of a week of scientific workshops, which has involved collaboration meetings between Cambridge and Munich. In organizing this live stream event, I'd like to express our gratitude to Intel Corporation and their Intel Studios team, and also the media team of Four Wings Creative. Thank you to both teams for making this event possible. It's been a huge effort during the present lockdown, but Stephen Hawking's motto was never give up, and Stephen never did give up. So we're doing our best, and please be patient if we fa face any technical challenges. We're also running these lectures in collaboration with the Stephen Hawking Foundation. Among their aims is supporting research and outreach in cosmology and fundamental physics at both university level and at schools. So we especially welcome the younger members of the audience this evening. You are our future scientists, welcome. We hope you enjoy these talks. 
Now, there will be an opportunity after the talks to quiz the speakers. So we have a website allowing you watching live to ask questions or vote for other people's questions. If you want to ask a question, then please follow the web link on the screen now. Using a browser on your phone or laptop, iPad, and follow the online instructions. Um, so to ask questions, please visit www.sli.do and search for COSMO with a capital C, Q for question. So let's begin our public lecture. One of my Munich colleagues is standing by, this Dr. Stella Seitz from LMU Observatory, and she will introduce our first speaker and the Q&A question immediately following our first speaker. So over to you, Stella. Thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Aichiro Komatsu to you. Professor Komatsu is a director at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching, near Munich, and honorary professor at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Professor Komatsu was born in Takaharutska, near Kobe in Japan. Already as a child, he was fascinated by the night sky, and he was trying to understand how our universe became like what it is today. So he studied physics at Tohoku University in Sendai and obtained his Master of Science degree in 1999. And just two years later, in 2001, he received his PhD from Tohoku University. His supervisors were Professor Toshifumi Futamasi from Tohoku University and Professor David Spergel from Princeton University. During the years of his PhD work, Professor Komatsu was already a visiting member at Princeton University and at the Institute for Advanced Study under the supervision of Professor David Spergel. After his PhD, Aichiro continued working in Princeton and became a WMAP postdoctoral fellow in Princeton University. Then in September 2003, again, only three years after his PhD two years, Aichiro was hired as assistant professor at the University of Texas in Austin. He quickly climbed up the career ladder to associate professor in 2008 and to full professor in 2010 in Austin. In 2012, he moved to Munich to the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, where he is director since. What is so exciting about Professor Komatsu's research? Why does he receive or his work receive so much attention? Understanding, measuring, and interpreting the cosmic microwave background of our universe is one of the main research focuses of Professor Komatsu. As we will learn from his talk later, the microwave background provides a snapshot of the infancy of our universe. And if we start understand the universe at early times and we know the laws of physics that govern its evolution, we can predict how it should look like today and we can compare with what we actually see on the night sky. Aichiro led several analysis of the microwave background data from the WMAP satellite mission, as he will explain in his talk. This allowed him to measure the key parameters of our universe with unprecedented accuracy. Professor Komatsu received many prizes for his outstanding scientific work. Among these were two very prestigious prizes for the WMAP science team as a whole. This was the 2018 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics and the Gruber Cosmology Prize in 2012. For his individual contributions to cosmology, Professor Komatsu was awarded among others, with the Koshiro Hayashi Prize of the Astronomical Society of Japan and the American Astronomical Society Berkeley Prize for meritorious work in astronomy. Professor Komatsu is one of the world-leading experts regarding the microwave background 
and its relation to the present day large scale structure of our universe. Aichiro, in addition, is very eager and very experienced in explaining this topic to students and non-experts. This makes him to an outstanding speaker for our evening talk today. Aichiro has recorded his today's lecture a little earlier to avoid any difficulties with the live stream, but he is also here with us live and he will be ready to answer questions straight afterwards. So as Anne already said, if there is something that you would like to ask, then please follow the website that you uh, will, be showing, will be shown on the screen. But now, enjoy Aichiro's talk. The title is, Where are we from? Clues from the light of the fireball universe. So let's go ahead and watch the video. Okay, thank you, Stella, for the kind introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for the invitation. Thank you all for joining us today for this remote lecture. I'm Eiichiro Komatsu. I'm a director at the Max Planck Institute of Astrophysics in Gahin, the suburb of Munich in Germany. Today, I'm very excited to tell you about our recent findings on the question, where we came from. To answer this question, we use the data that we collected for the light of the fireball universe. And we used a space telescope such as what you see on the screen now. Before we begin, let me set the stage for my lecture by showing you the animation from the Cosmic Voyage, that's IMAX theater movie filmed in 1996. Although this is not a scientific computer simulation of the universe, it captures the essence of today's lecture very accurately. So let me begin. Let's say our whole universe was in the hot, dense state nearly 14 billion years ago. Expansion started and wait, universe began to cool. Space doubles, temperature halves. Universe was opaque because electrons in the plasma would scatter light of the fireball universe. So light cannot propagate straight line. It, it cannot propagate freely. Until the temperature of the universe drops below 3,000 Kelvin, at which moment, like this, the universe became transparent because electrons and protons would form a neutral hydrogen that would not scatter the light as much as electrons would do. Now, so first thing you have to know is that the universe was opaque before. They became transparent at some point. But then you find lumps of matter in the universe which already existed during the fireball universe. These lumps of matter will collide each other because they gravitationally attract each other. They grow bigger and bigger by merging together with the surroundings and they eventually become galaxies. A galaxy contains lots of stars. Each star, now we know, contains multiple planets. And maybe if we're lucky, one of these planets or many of these planets will host life such as ourselves. So this animation will tell you that our ultimate origin was already there in the fireball universe. So there are two questions I want to give answers uh, today. One, okay, universe in the fireball universe was bright, you know, it's full of light. Where did the light go? I'll give you a very good answer for that. Second, you saw lumps of matter already existed in the fireball universe. Where did that come from? Because the origin of these lumps of matter, the initial irregularities would be our origin. We think we have good answer for what the origin was, but we, to have the definitive answer for this, we would have to keep investigating and we are hoping that in let's say near future, 15 years from now, well, within 15 years, we'll have a very good answer for you. Now, let me then tell you that everything I tell you today has solid theoretical and observational foundations. In other words, I don't make stuff up today. If I don't tell you I'm, I'm speculating, you can be assured that what I'm saying is based on solid 
Foundation. So relax, sit back, enjoy hearing the latest findings in the research in cosmology. So if you look up the night sky, you see stars. And that is the sky you'll see in a visual wavelength. And you see Milky Way, you know, gorgeous. But now, if you have appropriate machine to take the picture in microwave, let's say one millimeter wavelength, then you see the sky that looks like this. The sky is full of the light from the fireball universe. So to, the, uh, to answer the first question, where did the light of the fireball universe go? It didn't go anywhere. It's still with us. It's everywhere. We are immersed in light of the fireball universe today. Light of the fireball universe is pouring down on Earth. This is called the cosmic microwave background. So now these days, of course, you think that the air is full of novel coronavirus, and that's very depressing to think in that way. But I tell you, if you look at the volume of one sugar cube, that's one cubic centimeter, there are 410 photons, particles of light from the fireball universe. So we are literally immersed, we're surrounded by the photons of the fireball universe. So forget coronavirus for the moment, at least for next 30 minutes or so, think that you are in the middle of, you're surrounded by light of the fireball universe. Now, all of that is super complicated, and then you understand this in the head, but maybe you don't understand by heart. So to, to fix this problem of communication, I teamed up with a movie director, Mr. Kosaka, in Japan, who is well known for his beautiful movie for full dome projection. Namely, this is the movie for the planetarium, okay? And we created probably the world's first full dome movie dedicated to the cosmic micro background history and physics and research of that. So, but because this is a full dome movie, which I'm projecting on a screen, you have to imagine, okay, that uh, the middle of this uh, screen middle of the circle would be your zenith above your head. Then uh, the bottom would be front, top would be your back, sides are sides. So let's begin. The cosmic background radiation was predicted as a consequence of the expansion of the universe. The beginning of the universe was like a dense ball of fire. Everything was immersed in light. It was just like the center of the sun, like a fog where light couldn't travel straight. However, when the universe cooled down due to expansion, the fog cleared and light could travel farther. Shouldn't this light reach the Earth today? This light gives us the oldest picture of the universe that we can ever see directly. But the wavelength of this light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. And it has gone past visible light and turned into microwaves. Microwaves that come from every direction at once. That's the evidence for the expansion of the universe. That's right. So this makes our life very easy when we try to explain complicated concepts such as this one to the uh, public audience. So I hope you enjoy the movie. And then we have a few more of these. So indeed, the visible light has wavelengths, which you can see. And when universe was hot and dense, whole universe was shining like the surface of the sun. But as universe space expands, Wavelengths of the light will be stretched to the microwave today. We can't see it directly, but when you have a proper apparatus, you can see it. So what kind of apparatus can we use? Such as this one. So maybe young folks wouldn't recognize this is TV, okay? And if you don't know what this is, just ask your parents. So here is my friend, Professor Hiranya Paris, professor at UCL. She's holding a TV which is not tuned to any broadcast signal. 
So you have this static noise. And in fact, this TV is the receiver of the radio signals. Radio includes microwaves. And the 1% of this static noise is, in fact, light of the fireball universe. So you don't have to have anything sophisticated. You just have to get TV out of the uh, closet in your parents' house. And that's all you need. But of course, to do the research out of it, we need something better. 1964, Dr. Pengius and Dr. Wilson, working at Bell Lab in New Jersey, USA, used this gigantic radio antenna to study light from the uh, astronomical body called Cassiopeia A. That's a supernova remnant. And if you go to uh, Deutsches Museum, which is one of the world's world largest science and technology museum. Third floor, you see this one in 25th model of the Pengius and Wilson antenna in Bell Lab. This moves, so you can point this to anywhere in the sky that can be seen from New Jersey. And in the same floor, you can discover the real detecting system, detector system used by Pengius and Wilson experiment. So this is a real thing, no? It, for, for a person like me who investigate cosmic micro background on uh, a daily basis, this is a very important place. So if you look at the photo to the right in this metal machine, you see somebody taking a picture. Well, that's obviously me. And uh, uh, so what does this do? Light comes from the left and goes into this home antenna. Then you go to the uh, amplifier so that you can see the signal. Signal will be sent to the, the recorder, okay? That's fine, but then uh, what's important in this apparatus is that there's a calibrator. Very cold, five Kelvin, uh, above absolute zero temperature. So what you do is you get the signal from the sky and you compare the signal to the some signal of something you know. So you have the five Kelvin signal that you know, you compare sky signal to it and you measure the temperature of the sky. So day one, that Pangeus and Wilson turned on the apparatus, they discovered a problem. This recording, time goes from bottom to up, and the intensity of light increases from left to right. And what you see here is the, a very cold signal, the very left dip in the middle, that's five Kelvin. And everything else is above that, which means sky temperature somehow is brighter than 5 Kelvin. And that's a problem because people already knew at the moment that zenith sky temperature, top of our head, at this 7 centimeter wavelength is 2.3 Kelvin. Then you also account for all the things that you know about source of microwaves, such as antenna itself. Well, that's 0.8 Kelvin. You do the subtraction, and you're still left with 3.5 Kelvin signal that you don't know what the origin is. It turns out that this was the light from the fireball universe. So just having the measurement of the brightness of the sky at one wavelength, such as one seven centimeter, wouldn't tell you that this light comes from the fireball universe. To prove this, you need to measure the brightness of the light over a wide range of wavelengths and show that the spectrum of this light follows that of the fireball. What's shown in the line, let's say green line, is the spectrum of the fireball at the temperature of 2.725 Kelvin. That's super cold, right? Like a minus two, 270 Celsius. That's too cold to be called fireball. This suggests that the universe in the past was fireball. And we are simply seeing the same light with wavelengths stretched by the expansion of the space. So this tells you that magenta line is 4 Kelvin, yellow line is 2 Kelvin. So temperature is not neither 2 Kelvin nor 4, it's actually 2.725. How was this how was this discovery done? Let's watch the movie again. In 1989, the cosmic background radiation probe, COBE, was launched into space. Observations from outer space without disturbance by the atmosphere 
brought about a remarkable discovery. The spectrum of the cosmic background radiation matched the theoretical expectation of the Planck distribution. But the best was yet to come. The shape of this curve depends on the temperature of matter that emitted light. Using this property, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation was found to be minus 270.4 degrees Celsius. However, in detail, these curves vary slightly from place to place. That is, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation has fluctuations. That's right. So there you go. This is the uh, globe showing you the distribution of temperatures of cosmic micro background in the sky. So uh, Kobe made the discovery of the fluctuation and with this second generation satellite, WMAP, that we learned in 2001, we made more precise measurement, improving the uh, angular resolution of the measurement by uh, 35 times. So Kobe had the map, which has 6,000 pixels. With WMAP, we have a couple million pixels. So we have a vivid picture of the early universe, and this is the science team of WMAP, about 20 or so people. This is, was, picture was taken in 2002, seems like a long ago. And uh, so let's put this into the context. We are living inside the Milky Way, beautiful Milky Way that you see in the night sky. And sky is 360 degrees. So somehow we need to be clever about projecting it onto the screen. Let's do that. We call this galactic projection. Now you're seeing the sky in visible wavelengths. Now we go to longer wavelength. First, near infrared, far infrared, and some millimeter. By the time you go to microwave, you see, of course, yourself being uh, surrounded by the light from the fireball universe. But when you improve the contrast of your image by a factor of 100,000 times, got lots of contrast, you start seeing this ripples, okay? So these are the ripples, these are the clumps of matter that existed during the fireball universe. A remarkable thing is that the, this is our origin. These tiny fluctuations in the early universe, they gravitationally attract each other, they grow bigger and bigger, and they form galaxies. Galaxies have stars. Stars are planets, and planets host life. Yeah, so, and that's what we are observing. Yeah, that's a direct photograph of the early universe that we took using data from Kobe and the data from WMAP. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah, uh, observations of the cosmic micro background taught us a remarkable story. Okay, let's dig in there a little bit more because that seems very remarkable. So how does light of the cosmic micro background come to us? People have this impression that the Big Bang started from one point, but that's actually not true because if that were the case, we have a light here, they are just gone by now, okay? What happens was that the entire space was lit up like this, and if you had the light source one light year away, or they come, and one year later they pass. So we are witnessing the light that was emitted far away, far, far away, 13.8 billion years ago. And they finally came to us after traveling space for 13.8 billion years. And if we wait more, we see light coming from farther, farther away. But there's a limit because Okay, then can we use this to see the beginning of the universe? That's not quite possible because as you saw already at the beginning, universe in the fireball state was opaque. You can't see beyond this wall of the so-called last scattering surface at which light 
of the fireball universe are scattered by electrons for one last time. To go beyond and, and learn about really the beginning of the universe, we would have to use laws of physics, the power of the laws of physics, and go beyond the wall, like this. The cosmic background radiation is the wall at the edge of the visible universe. We cannot see directly the further past beyond this wall. But these temperature fluctuations may tell us what happened in the further past. The conditions beyond the wall of the cosmic background radiation could be thought of as a liquid with high temperature and high density. You could say it was like a hot soup. Something happened behind this wall that made waves, which can be seen in the fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation. There must have been a grand sound that shook the universe. We can learn a great deal about the universe if we can extract this cosmic sound. The origin of the sound would be the moment of the birth of the universe. So you heard that universe was like a hot soup, like this. This is the Japanese signature soup, miso soup. Miso soup is great because it's opaque, right? And then it's not so viscous, so that when you drop tofu into miso soup, it creates ripples, just like the real universe. So the thing is, when universe was so hot and dense, the matter was completely ionized and formed a plasma. This plasma behaves like a fluid, a soup. So let's imagine dropping tofu into a miso soup, and maybe we have two miso soups with different amounts of miso. In one, one hand, you drop tofu, create ripples, maybe ripples propagate differently depending upon how much miso you have in the soup. Or maybe you have potato instead of miso, like Germans love, you know? Kartoffel zuppe, but in that case, you drop kartoffel into it, nothing happens because it's too viscous anyway. Uh, so maybe that's the cosmic micro background that we're seeing. To prove that, how do we analyze the data? Okay, so what we do is to decompose this image into a set of waves. And if you're familiar with, Image processing, your photographer, you are movie director, uh, then you, you're familiar with how to analyze images uh, and you remove high frequency noise, you retain lower frequency uh, signals and so on. If you're a musician, you're also familiar with not image processing, but the processing of the acoustics data. Same thing, you decompose sounds into a set of waves and you try to uh, play with it. Universe is the same. Here we are trying to decompose ripples in the uh, cosmic micro background temperature into set the waves, and we plot the amplitude of waves as a function of the wavelength. Then you see that vertical axis is the amplitude of waves, the horizontal axis is one over wavelengths. As you go to the right, you're seeing shorter wavelengths as you go to the left you're seeing longer wavelengths. And the thing is, this looks like a wave. You, know, you see oscillations. Wow, universe was like a miso soup. This is the real data sets. You see, I'm not bullshitting. This is the real thing. And the fact that the universe behaved like a miso soup, I don't know if uh, Professor Peebles was thinking of miso soup at that time, probably not, but he was thinking of some other soup. This prediction was made in 1970. Discovery of the sound waves was done in 1999 to 2000. So sometimes theoretical physicists predict something remarkable and takes 30 years for confirmation. Here, we really thank you who support science by paying tax. Sometimes it takes decades for exciting discovery to be made, but we ought to be sometimes patient and then enjoy hearing the exciting discoveries such as this one. I hope you share the excitement here and we, we sincerely thank you for the support. 
So discovery was made theoretically and then confirmed in 1999. And for that, uh, Jim Peebles uh, shared the Nobel Prize in year 2019. Now this drawing looks pretty good actually, because that's how it looks in real life. So we took this picture in international conference in Goa, India, and then Jim Peebles holds an umbrella. I also hold an umbrella, why? So East Asians, uh, I'm Japanese, love umbrellas, both men and women want to have umbrella even under the sunshine because we want to protect our skins from UV radiation. So uh, I'm holding my wife's umbrella. Jim is holding my wife's uh, Taiwanese friend's umbrella so we all enjoy uh, sunshine. Anyway, in the meantime, in the same year, 1970, uh, scientists in, in Russia, the Moscow, Rashid Sunyaev and Yakov Zerdovich made the same theoretical discovery that the universe would behave like a, a, a miso soup. Maybe they were thinking about Bosch, I don't really know. Uh, same year. And they thought that, that this thing would be so tiny that it would never been discovered, but you know, science is such that after the decades of effort, it will finally be discovered. Picture you see here was taken in 2003 at the Princeton. Uh, so I was a student in Postdoc there. Rashi Sinev was visiting us. I took a picture because both Jim Peebles and Rashi Sinev were my hero. You know, for anyone working in this area of research, these two gentlemen are superheroes. Now, history is very interesting. Life is very interesting. After 2012, so about 10 years after that, I came to Max Planck Institute where Rashid Sunyaev was a director, so we became colleague. If I told Eiichiro Komatsu in year 2003, you eventually become a colleague of Rashid Sunyaev, he would faint. Okay. So life is very interesting. We can use a computer calculation to recreate the state of the universe this sound traveled through. The universe at this time was dense and behaved like liquid, such as a soup. Ingredients of the soup are the same as those in today's universe. Matter that makes stars and galaxies. And dark matter and dark energy exist, even though they cannot be seen directly by our eyes. Galaxies can keep their shapes thanks to dark matter providing gravity. It's thought that the universe's expansion is gradually speeding up due to some dark energy pushing space apart. These are the three main ingredients of the soup. Space expanded with time. Let's give some impact to the beginning of this model. Great, I have a pattern for the cosmic background radiation. The reason that this particular pattern does not match our observations is because the ratio of ingredients in the soup is wrong. Waves do not travel through in a thick soup like they do in a thin soup. I'll use the power spectrum to make the patterns match. I have to adjust the ingredients to make my calculation agree with the data. Incredible! The visible part of the universe, like stars and galaxies, makes only 5%. The universe is dominated by invisible components. So this is very interesting. Our universe is dominated by invisible components such as dark matter and dark energy. Well, that by itself is an exciting avenue of the research, but today we're questioning. Let's give some impact to the beginning of this model. What impact? Who gave that impact? Who dropped the tohus into the miso soup in the first place? Because there weren't tohus at the beginning, there'll be no sound waves. 
a leading idea is leading idea proposed by Stephen Hawking and others is that nobody gave the kick, initial kick. Tofu's quantum mechanically emerged. So this leading idea suggests that we all came from the quantum fluctuations. In the very early time, the visible universe was so small that the physics that governs the small world, the quantum mechanics, has to play a role. And in the quantum world, nothing is certain. You cannot tell how much energy there is in one location versus the other. Everything was fluctuating. That's fine, but typically, this microscopic world has nothing to do with macroscopic world, such as galaxy. So what's the missing link that connects small world to large world? And that's what we think is this idea of cosmic inflation. In the tiny fraction of a second in the early universe, universe exponentially became large. So uh, one thing that the uh, coronavirus did to the society is that now we all understand what the exponential growth means. It's a, it's a remarkable rate of increase of anything. This exponential expansion is so enormous, so rapid, that something of the size of atomic nucleus would become the size of a solar system in tiny fraction of a second. And that will stretch the wavelengths of the microscopic fluctuation to macroscopic scale, such as the galaxy. Now you hear that? And your first reaction is, what? <laughs> How can I believe such a statement? And of course, we always have to verify such a statement by observational data. And I tell you that since the first discovery of the temperature fluctuation by Kobe in 1992, we have accumulated the enormous amount of evidence in support of this prediction of the cosmic inflation and quantum mechanical origin of all structures. So we have a pretty good evidence, but we want more evidence. And that evidence would be the primordial gravitational waves. Now, why do we need more evidence? Because Carl Sagan says, the extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. And we think we're talking about extraordinary claim because we are saying essentially we all came from the quantum mechanical fluctuation. We, we got to have a very good evidence for that. So gravitational waves stretch space in this manner. You can't see gravitational waves by eye, so let's visualize that by having ring of particles and watch how they move. So gravitational wave changes distances between two points in such a way that the ring of particles will distort in this form. Now, if you uh, have cosmic micro background with uniform temperature and have it, gravitational waves pass through it, gravitational wave stretches space. When it's stretched, light of the, uh, the wavelengths of the light would also be stretched. When wavelengths is stretched, it's cold. So when you have electron in the middle of this, this electron will see, for example, from the left and right, cold photons, bottom, and top, you see hot, hot photons, when electrons scatter this photon and light comes toward us, okay? So light comes out of the screen and comes toward you, it's polarized. So there's a preferential direction in which electric field of the light wave would oscillate. How do we know that? Because when you have the sunlight being scattered by the windshield, this light is horizontally polarized. And to prove that, all you need is the polarized sunglasses, which you block light that oscillates in horizontal direction, but transmits a light that's vertically oscillating, and you can see through the car. OK. So to, to get the polarization, you need to have anisotropic incident light, such as that created by gravitational waves and scattering by something, in this case, electron. Okay. So if you look at beautiful temperature map taken by European space agencies, Planck satellite, that's a third generation CMB satellite after the map, that's a beautiful temperature map, but then they also measure the polarization. So that's the direction of the polarization as well as the intensity of the polarization. Unfortunately, this is not yet gravitational wave. This is in fact 
polarization coming from the sound waves. And to, to measure this polarization from gravitational waves, we need to have more measurements. So there are multiple ground-based experiments taking data in Chile and South Pole. Now, we, uh, we think that this is so important to do that uh, experimentalists are now joining forces together to have, let's say, Simon's Array. That's the joint experiment of groups in Chile and South Pole Observatory. That's the joint endeavor of the people working in the South Pole. But then we also think that it's so important that maybe we should put everything together and this will be cosmic micro background research stage four. If that's not enough, we're going to launch fourth generation cosmic microwave background satellite. And COBE was NASA, WMAP was NASA, Planck was ESA. This is the first time that the Japanese space agency, JAXA, will send cosmic micro background satellites into space. Let's see. So to summarize toward finding our origins, the quest so far is we think we have a very good evidence that we all came from the quantum fluctuation in the early universe, generated during the period of cosmic field tension. But to have the definitive evidence for such a grand claim, we would have to find gravitational wave that was generated during inflation. So let's say over the next 15 years or so, we might be able to tell that we all came from the quantum fluctuation Mass science history unraveling the mystery, all that might have started with the quantum fluctuation. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aichiro, for your excellent lecture and the fantastic movies. I'm sure it will have raised many questions in the minds of our audience. Just remember that you can follow the link on your screens if you would like to ask something. Aitiro, I would like to ask one question first, since this is a lecture to celebrate the birthday of Stephen Hawking. I believe you knew him. Is that right? When did yeah, you meet yeah. the first time? When was it? When did you meet the first time? So, um, as, you, as you said at the beginning, I spent nine years in Texas before moving to Munich, and I first met Stephen in April 2008 in a very interesting place called Cook's Branch Conservancy, which is a huge 23 square kilometer nature reserve near Houston, Texas. And uh, this place is owned by Mr. George Mitchell, who had a close connection with Stephen. Mr. Mitchell was a very successful business person, as well as an enthusiastic supporter of physics. He's actually perhaps best known as a pioneer of shale gas technology. And uh, Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation donated a very significant amount of funding to Texas A&M University to found the Mitchell Institute for Fundamental Physics and Astronomy. Now, the connection is, at that time, Mr. Mitchell asked for one condition to found this institute to connect the institute with Stephen Hawking. So the connection was established, and then uh, physicists, uh, not only in Texas a and but uh, at the other institutions, could have opportunities to meet with Stephen in this incredible na nature reserve. And uh, I think uh, he visited uh, there every year, uh, and uh, until 2013, when he became ill, but then uh, I met Stephen three times there in 2008, 2010, and 2012. And I think it was in 2010 meeting that, uh, for whatever reasons I don't recall anymore, I ended up playing Beethoven's uh, Moonlight Sonata in front of Stephen after the dinner. I don't, I don't know why, but anyway, I got this embarrassing moment. Don't ask me what happened after I'm, I'm done playing. It was the first time that uh, my wife also met with Stephen in 2010, and he gave her very charming wink. You know, it's very, <laughs> all this was so memorable. And uh, I, the last time I could greet with him was his 75th 
birthday conference in Cambridge. That was in 2017, and uh, that was the last time. Okay. Thank you, Aichiro, for that nice words. For, um, I think we'll turn now to the questions from the audience. Um, so there's Priyansh, uh, age 14, and she asks, if there was nothing before the Big Bang, then how was there space and time for the Big Bang to take place? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And of course, that's an appropriate question for this occasion, because that's what uh, Stephen and uh, his collaborators uh, worked a lot on. Now, for more kind of uh, ordinary researcher like me, <laughs> that question is too big, because we do not yet know how to make observation contact. So uh, we don't know that uh, there was nothing before the Big Bang. We just don't know. If we define the epoch of the Big Bang as the moment that the universe became hot, fireball, then we think that before the Big Bang, the moment the universe became hot, as you heard from my lecture, we think that there was a period of cosmic inflation. So it's definitely not nothing. Now, what happened before inflation? No one knows. Probably Stephen has some ideas. I'm sure Roger also has lots of ideas. But observationally, we're not there yet. We are still trying to figure out whether cosmic inflation actually took place. So we're still trying to you know, catch up with what the brilliant theorists such as Stephen and Roger were telling us. And uh, we're, we're getting there. OK, thank you. There's another question that asks, what areas of physics do you see developing most in the next 50 years? Yeah, that's great. You know, I mean, usually uh, senior researchers, I'm getting senior now, think that everything has been done. <laughs> uh, Lord Kelvin famously said, for example, no, no new physics will be discovered. And of course, he didn't know about quantum mechanics, right? So, uh, uh, so let's speculate, right, 50 years. Uh, I will be 96 in 50 years. I may be still doing physics, right? So let's say. So my guess is that it's going to be about life, I think. And uh, um, how, how is, so uh, life sounds like a biological thing, but the physics should uh, play a big role there, right? So what's the connection? Can we make sense of emergence of life? even consciousness in terms of physics. And also, does quantum mechanics play any role there? Because, for example, if you take what I said today at face value, everything was set when quantum fluctuations became big by inflation. Everything was set there. A the universe knew already where and when to form Milky Way and sun, solar system, earth, and life. And if there's nothing quantum there, the fact that I'm giving you lecture this moment has been already decided to the beginning. And can we believe that? And I don't think we're ready to answer that. And then, you know, 50 years from now, maybe we are really talking about how inflation happened, what was before the Big Bang, all the way, through the emergence of life and consciousness. So I, I would think that the Tao will probably be one of the big, big themes in 50 years. Thank you. We have one more question that asks, could it theoretically be that the Big Bang was actually a gigantic black hole which collapsed? Yeah, great question. And uh, why don't I defer that question to Roger? Because I know that that's precisely what he's working on now. And uh, he might be actually giving a talk on this during his lecture. So let's wait for that. If he doesn't answer that question, because it's a pre-recorded lecture, right? He, he wouldn't know that you're asking this question. Why don't you ask that question to Roger after his, uh, his lecture? That'll be, I'm looking forward to his answer as well, personally. Thanks for the question. So Edgar, aged 12, wants to know, do you think the theory of general relativity will break down at the smallest length scale possible, otherwise known as the Planck length? I think so. Uh, I think many people think, think that way. 
and Stephen Hawking, Roger Penrose, I mean, they are, they are both uh, working a lot on this area, and I believe both of them think that the general relativity would break down. General relativity, as we know, right? So general relativity is a classical theory that's not yet combined with quantum mechanics. And, uh, but the current best guess for what the quantum gravity idea is, which is string theory, in the Planck scale, definitely, theory yes. will be very different from general relativity. So at least we have a candidate theory at the Planck length, and we know that it's very different from general relativity. We don't know if that's true yet, but uh, we have some idea. We have very short time to ask um, one last question, and this is, what does the daily work of an astrophysicist um, of such high level look like? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I don't know if I'm, it's a high level, but uh, we check emails <laughs> and go to the uh, institute and then <laughs> open up the laptop, look at the data, right? Stay at it. We use the mathematical tools to analyze this data. Be hungry, get you know, lunch, <laughs> cup of coffee, but most importantly, talk with my colleagues, students, researchers, talking. The reason why we, we ever go to our research institute is to talk to people. So uh, I guess it's very much the same as your daily school life. Uh, you know, you wake up, get, get breakfast, go to school, talk to people, learn from people, play with people. Uh, that's what we do. We enjoy our research. No, and we just go to the institute to, to play with the universe. That's what we do every day. Thank you, I too. I think that's very true, the picture that you described. I'm afraid that this is also the last question and then we have to end now the live questions. So thank you again, Aichiro, for your fascinating insights. In, and I hope that everybody enjoyed the talk as much as I did. It was really great. And now I'm very curious about the rest of the lectures. And I'm now going to hand back to Anne Davis, please. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Achiro, for such an excellent lecture. We're now going to turn to our next speaker, Professor Sir Roger Penrose. But I do want to point out that if you didn't have, get the opportunity to ask some of your questions, then at the end of the programme, we'll have a panel of young experts available who'll continue to stay online to answer any questions live on air. I'd briefly like to introduce Hayley McPherson, who's going to be coordinating this and explain a little bit more about it. Hi, Hayley. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening after the lectures, please? Uh, hi, Anne. Yeah, of course. Thanks. So we've put together an expert panel of young researchers from Cambridge and Munich to answer any questions that Ichiro and Roger did not have time to deal with. So we have 10 pan panel members ready to answer your questions anywhere from black holes to the Big Bang. So we have five re researchers from Cambridge who appeared in the recent discovery series, Universe Unraveled, who are experts on black holes and on gravitational waves. And we also have five Munich researchers who are experts on cosmology, galaxies, and on the Big Bang. And we're all really looking forward to your questions and hopefully a really nice discussion. Back to you, Anne. Thank you, Hayley. That's great. And just another reminder that if you have questions, type them in to the Slido website which is on the screen now, and you can also vote for questions. That is to say, www.sli.do and search for COSMOQ. I'm very pleased now that one of my Cambridge colleagues, Professor Harvey Rial, who's a, himself is an expert on black holes and Stephen's former student, has agreed to introduce Stephen's lifelong collaborator and friend, Sir Pro Roger Penrose. Thank you very much, Harvey. Thank you, Anne. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Sir Roger Penrose. 
Roger is a mathematician and theoretical physicist. His work has led to profound insights into the nature of space, time, and gravitation. In the 1960s, he developed powerful new mathematical techniques for studying general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. These enabled him to prove his famous singularity theorem, which provides very strong evidence that black holes are not simply mathematical curiosities, but are actually formed in nature. Along with Roger's later cosmic censorship conjectures, the singularity theorem provides the theoretical foundation for our current understanding of black hole formation. For this remarkable work, Roger was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics. Roger has made many other important contributions to our understanding of black holes. He introduced the notion of conformal compactification of space-time, which provides the framework for a rigorous mathematical definition of a black hole. He introduced Penrose diagrams as a way of visualizing the structure of black holes. He also discovered the Penrose process for extracting energy from rotating black holes. Later in the 1960s, Roger joined forces with Stephen Hawking to extend these new mathematical techniques to cosmology. The resulting Hawking-Penrose singularity theorem provides strong evidence that our universe must have begun with a Big Bang singularity. Roger is the inventor of twister theory, which is an ambitious program originally aimed at developing a quantum theory of gravity. Although this goal has not yet been achieved, Twisted theory has found many other important applications in both mathematics and in theoretical physics. For example, in recent years, it has provided a powerful tool for performing calculations in particle physics. Roger has made influential and provocative contributions to quantum theory. He suggested that gravitation is responsible for wave function collapse, which may provide a way of avoiding seemingly paradoxical situations such as Schrodinger's cat, involving a quantum superposition of macroscopic objects. In his 1989 book, The Emperor's New Mind, Roger argued that wave function collapse may play an important role in explaining human consciousness. Another of Roger's well-known discoveries is the Penrose tiling, which provides a way of tiling your bathroom using tiles of just a few different shapes in such a way that the pattern never repeats itself. Together with his father, Roger investigated so-called impossible objects, which are objects that can be drawn on a piece of paper, but cannot exist in the real world. This had a strong influence on the artist M.C. Escher. For example, Escher's famous picture, Ascending and Descending, shows what is sometimes referred to as a Penrose staircase. Uh, let me summarise and end with a brief uh, description of Roger's career history. So he, he received his PhD from Cambridge in 1958 and held positions at various universities before settling down in Oxford, where he is now Emeritus Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics. He has received many prizes and distinctions, too many for me to list them all, so I'll mention just a few highlights. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1972 and later received the Society's Royal Medal and then the Copley Medal. He was knighted by the Queen in 1994 and appointed to the Order of Merit in 2000. He has received honorary doctorates from many universities and in fact well, he was due to receive one here in Cambridge last summer but unfortunately that was delayed by the pandemic. So we, we look forward to welcoming Roger here in person to receive that degree sometime in the near future. Roger was awarded the Wolf Prize in Physics jointly with Stephen Hawking in 1988. And as I mentioned at the start, Roger was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. Uh, now, to avoid any problems with live streaming, Roger has agreed to pre-record his lecture. The present lockdown means that he had to record himself from home, patiently facing a number of technical challenges. However, Roger is also here with us live and will be ready to answer questions straight afterwards. So let's now hear what Roger has to say about black holes, cosmology, 
and space-time singularities. Well, thank you, Harvey. It's really a great pleasure for me to be able to give this talk in honour of Stephen Hawking's 79th birthday. And I want to talk about Herman Minkowski's idea of space-time, which he introduced in 1908. Einstein, in 1905, had introduced his idea of special relativity, but he thought of it in terms of equations and things like that, whereas Minkowski made it geometry. It's the four-dimensional geometry of space together with the extra dimension of time. So we have, imagine, say, three axes of space. These are the coordinates, these are spatial coordinates, and then another axis to describe time. And this encapsulates basic, the basic ideas of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Now, the important thing about Minkowski's picture is basically how light behaves. So we think of a light ray, which I have in the picture now. This is the history of a photon, if you like, a light ray. And it is tilted at so that it, you, you picture it as traveling with the speed of light. In order that it doesn't sort of point off completely along the floor, you have to have your coordinates com comparable with each other. So that the speed of light is something uh, that it looks like, say, tilted at 45 degrees or some reasonable angle like that. Now, of course, there are lots and lots of light rays, and they will, all the different light rays through the central point, the origin, will describe this thing called the the null cone, which you see in orange here, and it's more important than the individual light rays, so let's remove that. It's more important than the axes, so remove that. This cone describes the most important structure of space-time. It tells you how light behaves. Now, if we think of Einstein's general theory of relativity, then the space-time becomes curved. At each point, we have one of these null cones, and the you, although this looks like a two-dimensional surface, you've got to imagine that it's really four-dimensional, and these little cones, uh, actually, the little circle at the top of them, you think of as being a sphere, but don't worry too much about that. You can get away with thinking of the picture of four dimensions by visualizing a lower number of dimensions. It gets a pretty good idea of the picture. Now, these light cones can, can behave in complicated ways. At the central point of this picture, you imagine a flash of light, and that's the light cone as it goes out into space-time, and it's tangent to the light cones wherever it goes. But it can do weird things like crossing over. You see at the back of this picture, at the top right-hand side, you will see these light rays start to cross over, and you have a thing called a course stick and a crossing region where they cross over each other. And it makes it quite complicated, but it is important to understand something about the way these cones behave on these, these caustic regions where they cross over, and I'll come back to that later. It will be relevant to what I want to say. Now, in 1939, there was a paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder where they described the collapse of a spherically symmetrical dust cloud. Now, dust is a technical term which means matter with no pressure. And their, their picture, this is now a space-time picture. I'm not sure they drew a picture like this, but this is more or less what their description was. You imagine time going upwards. So you could take sections of this picture as you go up and up and up and up, and that would be the evolution as time evolves. And the cones you will see start tilting in strange ways as they go up at the top. Now this picture was known, as I say, when they wrote this paper, and it does describe what we currently would, would think of as of the collapse of a dust cloud to form a black hole. However, um, people, I think, didn't necessarily take it very seriously because particularly, well, first of all, you say the dust doesn't have any pressure. That's not really the important point. The important point is that everything is spherically symmetrical, so it falls absolutely radially inwards to the central point. And you'll see in the middle, you see this singularity, which is where the dust becomes infinite density because it's all focused into the middle. And people said, well, that's not very really realistic because it might swirl, swirl around. It may not be completely symmetrical. It might have pressure. So why do we take this picture seriously? Well, in the 1960s, people started seeing things called quasars, where they call them quasi-stellar objects originally. And they were very bright. They were brighter than say, a hundred or a thousand times an ordinary galaxy's brightness, and yet they were pretty small. That is to say, because they varied in brightness, 
within periods of a few hours or a few weeks, which means that because of the speed of light, we'd have to travel that distance. Um, you, you would have to have something which was at least not bigger than something like the solar system. And to squeeze all that energy producing stuff in the middle of the in, in single solar system means that you've got something like the kind of densities involved in the picture that you have here, the Oppenheimer Snyder collapse. So people started to worry about whether something like this was going on. How does the energy get out? I mean, is there a radiation of some sort? And how does it get out if it just falls in radially? So people didn't take this picture terribly seriously, I think. There was, in fact, in the early 60s, a paper by Lifshitz and Kalatnikov in which they had claimed that in the general case, in general relativity, you would not get singularities. So this would imply that instead of falling into this central point, if you had irregularity in, in a general case where you had in a, not completely spherically symmetrical, but in a complicated kind of collapse, it might swirl around in a complicated way and come swishing out. So I think that was a common view that people had, that it wouldn't be, the spherically symmetrical picture was not realistic. So I began thinking about this. John Wheeler I was working with at, uh, at that time and somewhat earlier, and uh, he was worrying about this problem about what happens. I mean, is the Oppenheimer Snyder picture realistic or are the Russians right to say that when you swirl around, the thing will come swirling out again? And I, I didn't really know. I had a look at the paper that the Russians had written and I didn't, there was actually a, mis a serious mistake in the paper, which I didn't notice. I didn't see the mistake. What I did see was techniques which I was a little worried that they didn't seem completely convincing that these arguments would be utterly foolproof, and I wasn't really convinced one way or the other. And I remember going walking in the woods and worrying about how you would characterize a collapse which had got beyond a point of no return. And uh, I, well, let me go back a bit first, because I learned first about the picture I've just been showing, the Oppenheimer side of the collapse. Uh, I didn't see their paper, but I was in I think I was in Cambridge in my second year as a research fellow, and I had a friend and mentor who was Dennis Sharma, who taught me a lot of physics. He was very influential in my understanding of physics. I was doing pure mathematics up to that point. And he suggested that I would go and listen to a lecture given in London by David Finkelstein. And David Finkelstein described the Schwarzschild solution. The Schwarzschild solution was the description of a spherically symmetrical body. Um, it's the one that Oppenheimer and Snyder used, but not in the coordinates that they were using. Uh, the original Schwarzschild picture looked as though that you had a singularity at this place where the light cones start to tilt over and the light doesn't seem to be able to get, it gets sort of trapped at that place. It's what we now call the horizon. But people used to think of that as a singularity, because if you write down the equations in the way Schwarzschild did, you see that the metric, the, the description of how the light cones behave and so on, blows up. You just, things go to infinity and it doesn't make any sense. There were uh, cosmologists, I think Lemaitre in particular, who had looked at this thing and decided that it didn't really, the, the Schwarzschild horizon, the Schwarzschild singularity, which is what people called that, this is um, when the radius became what's called 2m, m is the mass, and you use unit, units where the gravitational constant is one and speed of light is one, and all that's just convenient. And then this Schwarzschild radius, which would be, if you take the sun and squash it down spherically symmetrically, then the place where it would reach this Schwarzschild radius would be a few meters. If you took the Earth, it would be, I don't know, about a centimeter or something like that. So uh, it's very unrealistic for an ordinary star, or certainly for a planet. So people didn't really believe that these things would get that small. Nevertheless, uh, there was work which showed if you have um, things like, uh, well, neutron stars or, or, or white dwarf stars in particular, then you do, do get trouble when, when they possibly collapse and they cannot uh, support themselves. So people did worry about these things. And in fact, Wheeler and others, uh, I remember um, Fred Hoyle and his collaborators uh, were really wondering whether the Schwarzschild radius might be coming in and producing some horrible thing. So 
if you take the Oppenheim and Schneider collapse, you see you don't get a, a singular state there. It just seems to fall through until you get the singularity in the middle, but maybe that's not realistic because it would swirl around and do complicated things. Anyway, I remember walking in the woods and worrying about uh, the thing that, that David Finkelstein has explained to me, and I'd worried when he explained it to me that um, you uh, have this singularity apparently of the Schwarzschild radius, which is not a singularity, but by choosing the right coordinates, you can sort of fall through it, and it's not a singularity, it's what we now call a horizon. Nevertheless, you still get the singularity in the middle, and it didn't seem that there's any way of getting rid of that singularity in the middle. And I wondered whether that was a general theorem or something. Is there a theorem which said if you had a very irregular collapse, did you still get a singularity? You seem to get rid of the one at, at the Schwarzschild radius, but can you get rid of it altogether? And I wondered whether there was a theorem or something of that sort. That was in 1958, and I really didn't know very much about general relativity. I started to think, what do I know about general relativity that other people might not know? And maybe that would be useful to me if I was going to try and prove something like this. And I thought, well, I know something about um, space-time, which is probably not very well known, which was the idea of two-component spinners. I learned about these from Paul Dirac, the great physicist, in lectures where he was describing quantum mechanics and then quantum field theory. And in the lectures in quantum field theory, I think this was the term which I went to in my first year as a research fellow, and um, he deviated from his normal course and described two component spinners. Now, you see, Dirac was interested in spinners because he was very famous for having introduced the equation for the electron, which is called the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation uses what are called four spinners. They've got four components. And Dirac was, I think, aware that you could split them down into two two-component spinners. But the two-component spinners were a little more primitive, but you needed the four, two of them, if you like, to, to, to two of the two-component spinners to make the proper Dirac equation for the electron. But he knew about the two component spinners, and he described them in this lecture, which made them completely clear to me. I'd wondered about them before for various other reasons. And this picture that you see here uh, is really a picture of a geometrical description of a two spinner. On the left, you see the celestial sphere. So if you like, that's, well, it's the either the past light cone, which goes out to infinity, that's the sky when you look out at the sky, or it's where your light rays go out into the future. It's the future sky, if you like. Uh, and so that's the celestial sphere. It is a real sphere. Now we're talking the right number of dimensions. Now, a spinner, a two-component spinner, determines a single point on the sphere. So on the left, you see that point. And on the right-hand side, you see the, the little flag pointing out from the origin point. And the flag, where that little flag points is the other piece of information you need to know how to describe geometrically what a two-component is. It has a curious property that if you rotate it through 360 degrees, it doesn't get back to itself. It goes back to minus itself, so you have to go twice before it gets back to itself. But that was a curious feature. And I knew about these things. I got familiar about them from Dirac's lectures. And I just thought, will these be any use in general relativity? I didn't see anybody use them before. That were, Some people had, but not to my knowledge. And uh, what I was rather surprised by was how it made the curvature much simpler than in the normal description. You could see that the curvature split nicely into two parts. One is called the Ricci part. That in this picture, you see it causes light rays. Um, I've got an observer at the top. And looking back, you see the light rays start to bend inwards. This is focusing due to the what's called the Ricci tensor. And Einstein's equations the Ricci tensor is what the matter describes. So the, the matter density is described in Einstein's theory by the Ricci tensor. And the Ricci tensor focuses the light rays inwards in that way. The remaining part is what's called the Weyl tensor. And the Weyl tensor is, when you describe it in two component spinners, it becomes a very, very simple thing. When you write it in tensors, it's a great mess. But in two component spinners, it made a very simple thing, and I really could understand much better how it behaved. And it's important because it describes the free gravitational field. It's, it is the, the analog. Um, Maxwell has this wonderful theory of electromagnetism, where the 
theory has two things which compose compose it. There's what's called the charge current vector, so that's the charge and the current. And then there's the field, which is the electromagnetic field. Very important because that's you're seeing me through radio waves and things which are Maxwell had predicted. So the electromagnetic field is is described by the field tensor, and then the source is the uh, charge current vector. Now, in general relativity, you have the analog of that. The field is the vial curvature, and the source is the mass. The, Re the Ricci tensor is given by the mass. And you can see in this picture how very differently they behave. So the, the distortion is what's given by the vial curvature, and that is really free gravity. Now, I want to move over to the next picture here. This is a picture in the paper which seems to have got me the Nobel Prize, which is the generalization I had of the Oppenheimer-Snyder picture. You see, it really is the Oppenheimer-Snyder picture, but I've now drawn it a little bit more carefully than the one we had before. We see the dust cloud um, collapsing inwards at the bottom of the picture, and time going up the picture, so it falls inwards towards center. Now that is, if it's spherically symmetrical, that is the Oppenheimer-Snyder picture. Now I was interested in what happens if you wiggle this picture, that is, if you have the matter not really completely spherically symmetrical, but something irregular. Do you still get this nasty thing in the middle where the curvatures go to infinity and it's called the singularity and people don't like the idea of the singularity um, because your equations simply give up at that point. Now, is this going to persist? Or when you have a general complicated collapse, does it sort of wiggle around and come swirling back out again? Well, the way I, what I thought I knew walking around, well, it was in a later conversation I was having with somebody with Ivor Robinson, and I had this idea of a trapped surface. Now, you see in the middle of this picture a little ring. This ring is going round the matter. It's surrounding, it's surrounding the matter, but just, just a little too late because it's got inside the horizon. The horizon is described by this cylinder that you've seen going upwards to the top. That is where the light cones start to point inwards, and light can't escape from inside that region. Now, if you have this trapped surface, which is the little ring going, I call it a trapped surface because although, as I said before, the picture is you're losing a dimension, and that ring looks like a little circle where it's really a two-dimensional surface because you've got to have an extra dimension, but don't worry too much about that. The point about it is that, that you can imagine a flash of light on that ring, and as that flash of light, what's its history going to be? You can see that its outward part is falling inwards as well as the inward part. So let me move on to see what this is. Here I have an element of that. The bottom is a little, now I've drawn it as a two-dimensional surface. So we see that little element of the surface, and the flash of light, there will be an outward flash, and there will be an inward flash. The outward flash is on the right, coming to, uh, up, moving up to the right. The inward flash is on the left. And the history of that is the cone that you see, so that the little flash of light um, I'm trying to draw two, two, two dimensions and the space time at the same time, so it's a little confusing the picture, I'm afraid, but that is the picture of what a little flash of light would do. Now here is what a trapped surface would do. Look at the top left of the picture. Here we have a little piece of surface. It's an ordinary two-dimensional surface. You imagine a flash on that two-dimensional surface all over it all at once, and if it's bending on the concave side, it will flash of light, the rays will be falling, in, converging. On the convex side, they will be diverging. Now, that's the normal experience. On the right top, you will see what I'm picturing a trapped surface would be like. On, on the one side, they're converging, and on the other side, they're converging. And that's just what you get on this trapped surface. And if you wiggle it a little bit, that will still be true. So it's a sort of what you call a stable property. You can change the so that the geometry is not spherically symmetrical. It could be quite complicated, but close to being the picture that I showed you before, but not like it really could be significantly different. And you could imagine as the, as the material falls inwards to the center, that the differences will get more and more, and the swishing around gets more and more complicated, so it could easily, you could imagine, swirl around and come out again. Now, you might think this is a very strange thing to have the light rays converging on both sides. It's not really all that strange. On the bottom of the picture, you see uh, a general case where this can happen. I thought of two points in space-time, and these are their past cones. 
and the intersection, you've not got to imagine, to get the mention, dimensions right, that's really the little piece of a surface as they intersect at the bottom, and the light rays will be converging on both sides. What's strange about a trapped surface is not so much that the light rays converge on both sides, but they do this at the same time as the surface being closed in on itself. And that's what I call a trapped surface. Now, what I considered in this situation is the future of that trapped surface. So in the picture I showed you a moment ago, we had the shaded in the region to the future of that surface. What do I mean by the future of that surface? I mean that all the places you could get to without exceeding the speed of light. So that's the future of that surface. All, all the regions of space-time that you can reach without exceeding the speed of light. Now, what's the boundary of that region going to be like? Well, you see, you remember on the very early picture I showed you what the light cone of a point did. It starts to cross itself, and you get situations like this in this picture where you see the light rays start crossing each other, and it's really a nuisance if you want to have to think about that. But the key point of it is, is that you don't have to. You need to know that the light rays start to converge, and you get these things called conjugate points, that thing in the middle there. And once you find a conjugate point, you've known it's gone at least as far as where these light rays start crossing each other. And so you have to stop off before that happens. So what you get is a, something a little complicated in its shape. It's the boundary of the future of this surface. But it doesn't have all these complicated caustics and crossings. Well, I mean, you do start to cross, and when they cross, then that's the end of the boundary. So it's, I can't go into the details of this, but it was a useful thing to think of, and it enabled me to produce this theorem, which showed that as long as the energy does not go negative, that is that when the rays start to focus, you remember I had this bundle of rays focusing inwards by the Ricci tensor, and the thing is that when you have positive energy, this can distort it, but it can't stop the inward focusing. It's got to get a, what we call a conjugate point to the, to the point which the observer is looking from. And it was this feature that you have, a, have to have a boundary, you have to have a boundary of the future which is compact. It's what's called compact. It means it's sort of finite in a sense. And, and this compactness is inconsistent with having a surface of evolution which is sort of a uh, well, non-compact. You imagine that the collapse to the black hole takes place with a very, very large region. So we can call that non-compact. It's just a very big region. And this region essentially goes out to infinity. And that collapses inwards through this play, this thing which you can sort of fo can sort of focus back or project backwards to your initial surface or your Cauchy surface, as it's sometimes called. Uh, and that Cauchy surface, uh, you've got a finite region, which is a compact region in this non-compact space. And that's a contradiction. I want to, don't want to go into that argument, but that was the argument which my uh, theorem depended upon. Now, I gave a talk about this in, uh, I think it was in 1964, at King's College London. And... Uh, in, in the movie, you will see me giving a talk like in front of me, but somebody like supposed to be me, giving a talk about this theorem. And you see in the audience, there's Stephen Hawking with sparks coming out of his head, getting inspired by this talk. In, in reality, he was not there. However, it wasn't so bad because my colleague, as I mentioned, Dennis Sharma, who was very important to me in the history of my understanding of physics, he heard about my lecture in London and decided to have a repeat in Cambridge. And Stephen Hawking was at this repeat in Cambridge, and he uh, heard the techniques I was using in the talk, and he, uh, then I had a, a private session with him and with George Ellis, possibly Brandon Carter. No, George Ellis was there. And uh, the, the three of us discussed the techniques that I was using, and... Uh, in quite a lot of detail, and Stephen picked up on this. And initially, he very quickly used my theorem in a way I hadn't expected. You see, I was thinking of using it as a local collapse to show that the black holes produce singularities. And he thought of it in a different way. He was thinking of this uh, describing the whole universe. So you're thinking of a universe which is non-compact, so it's not closed spatially. 
you must say, say it's going out to infinity. And uh, you could use my theorem, but in the reverse direction in time. The arguments don't really depend on which way time is going. So you can use them one direction or the other direction in time. What was surprising to me about his use of this was to use his answer to infinity rather than for a local argument. And yes, you can use the same argument to show that in a cosmological situation, if there is enough matter around to cause the light rays to converge um, out, way out, now, now you're not talking about a local collapse, you're talking way out at what's called the, the sort of horizon that you see, and the light rays may start to bend inwards at that point. And so this was his argument. That, I was very impressed by how quickly he'd found this. Now, one of the troubles with this argument was that it depended upon the universe being spatially non-compact, and it might be compact. That is, uh, it might actually close up in itself spatially. And so Stephen started thinking of generalizing these arguments in ways which did not depend on that, did not depend on the Cauchy surface. I should say a little bit more about a Cauchy surface. You see, usually in physics, what you do is you try to predict the future. So you know what's happening, say, at a particular time, and then if you have enough information on that time, you can evolve using your equations to see what happens in the future. And this surface is called a Cauchy surface, and it's, you've got enough information so you can evolve it to tell you what's going to happen in the future. So Stephen Hawking introduced this idea of a Cauchy horizon, which is this thing with the H, H plus of S, which is the Cauchy horizon. And he looked at the structure of the Cauchy horizons, and it's very much like the boundary of a future, but the other way in time. And so you can use very many of the same techniques that we were using before to talk about Cauchy horizons. And this enabled him to generalize the arguments that i have been using and to dispense with the notion of a Cauchy surface. I thought this was a really important development, and certainly when you're talking about cosmology. And so Stephen had three papers in the Royal Society using these techniques, and then uh, we had another paper finally together, which we wrote, which generalized more or less all the theorems that we had before, which uh, 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 was a major contribution due to, due to Stephen in this, which I think uh, certainly one of the most important things he did. I'll come to one of the other most important things he did in a moment. But first of all, you see, he was more interested really in the Big Bang and in uh, was that a generic phenomenon? Or might have there been a bounce of some sort before some previous universe which collapsed and somehow swirled around and came out again? And lots of people had pictures of that nature. Or was that necessarily a singularity? And that's what one seemed to conclude from all this, is it was necessarily a singularity. Now, I want to say a little bit more about this picture. This is a picture, basically, uh, the standard kind of cosmological picture that we have. You see at the top part of the picture, this exponential expansion. This is, um, well, various things got the Nobel Prize. This one with the uh, observations of the distant supernova stars of the expanding exponential expansion that you start to see at the top part of this picture. So it starts to bend outwards and expand exponentially. At the back, you may see some rather frizzly, um, uh, it's not quite clear what's happening. That's deliberate because I don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is actually open or closed. So it might close up on itself, or it might really go on forever. I don't care in what I'm going to say here, because it works either way. Uh, but it's useful to pretend that it closes up at least for a bit, because then I can draw the pictures more nicely. Now, what does current cosmology say about the Big Bang? You see, I kept worrying about the uniformity of the Big Bang. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But the Big Bang is not a really very generic situation, and it's very smooth. And cosmologists like to have a look to see what's going on in the very early universe, and they introduce this idea of inflation. Inflation is described in this picture. What do you see in this very powerful microscope, which I've, or magnifying glass, which I've shown? What you see, according to current cosmology, is this inflationary phase, which looks like the exponential expansion 
of the re remote future. But another one, which was supposed to have taken place in, well, 10 to the minus 32 seconds, a ridiculously tiny fraction of a second. Now, that ridiculously tiny fraction of a second, I never really took it seriously. It seemed to me it was you had to introduce the strange inflaton field in order to make it work. And I didn't really think it did work for the reason which I'll come to, because well, you see, this is the picture we had before, and you imagine that inflation is supposed to smooth everything out. It does other things which are more respectable. But the smoothing out of the universe, I never really thought it did that it worked. Why did I think that? Well, think about the time reverse of this picture. So now it's a collapsing universe, and the universe is now collapsing, and it could be full of all sorts of black holes and things which cause a great big mess. You don't expect to see this very nice singularity at the, at, the, at the top, you see a huge mess. That's the most likely thing you would see, something much more like this picture, where you have black hole singularities all messed together and fusing a very, very general singularity. And so I thought, well, if inflation is supposed to get rid of the mess like this, why? You see here, inflation doesn't do anything. It doesn't change the picture at all. When you get curvatures, it's this great, the infraton field is nothing. So why did you not get a universe which started like this, completely different from what we do see, with the vial curvature going completely wild, as in fact the Belinsky, when I said Lifshitz and Kalatnikov, Belinsky found a mistake, I think it was Belinsky, who found a mistake in the paper. When corrected, they found a much more general type of singularity, which could really be a generic singularity, the, the kind of mess which I'm trying to describe in this picture here in, in some kind of schematic way. But nothing like the very smooth picture that we really seem to see for our universe. And I kept wondering about this. Why on earth is it not like that? Why is the universe not one of these very complicated things? And I remember um, thinking about all the different different kinds of collapse singularities you can have, and cosmologists never thought about these. And I remember seeing uh, James Peebles, who was the winner of the Nobel Prize, last year, and he had uh, done amazing work on, on the first 380,000 years of the universe existence, and we know a lot about that. Um, and I said, why don't you consider these more complicated? And he looked at me and said, because the universe isn't like that. And that was a, made a big influence on me, because I thought, my gosh, it's not like that. And then I thought, why on earth isn't it like that? It's really a hugely important factor which is very deeply connected with a thing called the second law of thermodynamics. You see, there's something very paradoxical, because when you go back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is when you start to see light coming out, that's called the last scattering surface or the decoupling surface, not quite the same, but they're almost the same, and that is what the light you actually see coming from there. And it is very, very uniform. I think that's what James Peeble was really saying, is that we have this evidence that the universe is extremely uniform, way, way, way back as far as we can see it. And not just that, we see from the spectrum of the frequencies that we see that it is what's called a, 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 a Planck spectrum, which means it's maximum entropy. And I thought, this is a paradox. You're going back and back and back and back in time. According to the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy, that is the randomness, should be increasing. And you see the very earliest thing you directly see, you see randomness as a maximum. That is this Planck spectrum, which is the telling you that the entropy is at a maximum. Now, in this picture here, I've got in the top three pictures, the normal sort of picture people have of entropy increasing. Let's imagine a gas in a box. And we have a little smaller box, which is containing all the gas. Originally, in the bottom, it's, I'm talking about the top left picture, I'm talking about the bottom right part of that top left picture. And we've got all the back, uh, gas trapped in the little box. Now you open the box and let the gas spread out. So as entropy increases, the randomness increases, you see the gas spreads out more and more uniformly through the box. And that is the normal picture we see of the uh, second law. But we see in the actual universe, way back at this 380,000 years after the Big Bang, you see the top right-hand picture, 
and we see the bottom left-hand picture. Now, the bottom left-hand picture, the bottom left-hand picture is what you see for gravitating bodies. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is the very extreme difference you have between a gas in a box and gravitating bodies. So imagine those are stars or something like that. And as they evolve in time, with entropy increasing, they get more and more and more clumpy. And they get black holes, right? At the end, you get black holes where the entropy absolutely rockets up hugely. Even right now in our current universe, by an absolutely enormous figure, the entropy is almost entirely in black holes, according to the famous Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole. So what we are seeing in the very early universe is this very curious imbalance between matter, top right, gravity, bottom left. So the, the matter is uniformly distributed, but when I say gravity bottom left, I mean that the gravity, gravitational entropy is at a minimum. And I'm really puzzled about this. There's something very, very odd about the Big Bang. It is ra completely random as far as we can see, pretty well completely random as far as the matter, and completely unrandom with regard to gravity. So we have to have a theory which is imbalanced in this very strange way. Now, people try to say, well, what do you, how do you describe the singularities? Well, the singularities are where quantum gravity comes in. You see, you've got to have the quantum mechanics starts come in when the curvatures, the radii of curvature become, well, what's called the Planck length or the Planck, the Planck time is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. I mean, ridiculously tiny scale. So you've got curvatures are absolutely huge because the radius of curvature is absolutely tiny. And so then, then quantum mechanics would come in, and so who knows what goes on. That's the sort of picture people have. So I thought, well, whatever quantum gravity is, it must be a very, very peculiar theory. It must be very completely time asymmetrical because it gives you, in the remote future, these black holes, this bottom right of this picture here. And in the beginning, you'll be seeing bottom left of the picture here. And why does quantum gravity give you this huge imbalance? And so I, for many, many years, I puzzled about this, and I couldn't make sense of it, until I started to think about infinity a little bit more. And let me try and describe this Escher picture. It's a very beautiful way. He has these, I think there are five different pictures describing uh, the infinity of what's called hyperbolic geometry. Don't worry about the geometry. What we're going to worry about is the infinity. These are... Uh, this is the first of Escher's circle limits, and you see these fish creatures. I'm going to point out particularly their eyes, because they're exact circles. And as they get smaller and smaller towards the edge, their eyes remain exact circles. In fact, the angles on their wings, or whatever you call them, the fins, are the same right towards the edge. What this means is that the geometry to, right out to the edge is the same if we think of it as conformal geometry. Now, what is conformal geometry? See, normally you think of Euclidean geometry, you talk about distances, sides of lengths of angles. You have a triangle, and you've got the lengths of the sides, and that's part of Euclidean geometry. But if we just don't talk about the angles, then that means you don't think about lengths. And this is conformal geometry. It's a very beautiful kind of geometry, which generalizes the Euclidean notion of geometry. And here we have a this thing called hyperbolic geometry, and the whole of it is depicted in this conformal picture. So the, the fish in the middle, as far as they're concerned, are just the same as the ones way out towards the edge, although it gets very, very crowded towards the edge, and you look as though they look to us as though they're very small. As far as they're concerned, they're just the same as the ones in the middle. Their conformal geometry is the same as the conformal geometry in the middle. So what's nice about this is with these pictures, you can describe infinity as a place. So if you are only interested in the conformal geometry and not just the sizes of things, the shapes, if you like, the shapes of small things, then you can squash the infinity down and think of it as a boundary. And that's what I want to do to space time. So this is what I'm trying to do in the next picture. The conformal geometry in space-time is described by the light cone or the null cone. You see, if you want the metric, then you've got to put these surfaces which tell you distances. 
highs at distances where we imagine particles zipping along and when they heat, it's really times, it's times which define the, the metric. And they encounter these little bowl-shaped surfaces at the top or the hill-shaped ones at the bottom. And what determines where those things are? Well, it's the two most famous formulae of 20th century physics. At the top, we see Einstein's E equals mc squared. At the bottom, we see Max Planck's E equals h nu. Put them together, that tells you that the first, the top one tells you energy and and mass are equivalent, the bottom cells then your frequency equivalent, but both together tell you energy and frequency equivalent. So any massive particle, I should say mass and frequency are equivalent. So any massive particle is a clock, a very, very perfect clock. And there's it's what this described in the picture. The surfaces are there when you have mass. What happens when you don't have mass? Well, a photon doesn't even see the surfaces, doesn't experience the passage of time at all. So as far as the photon is concerned, we don't even have the metric. You have the conformal structure. So if you have a massless things, you're only interested in conformal geometry. If you're only interested in conformal geometry, then you can squash down infinity, and you can do it with a nice space-like surface. So it's like a time, if you like. It's time infinity. And that happens because of the cosmological constant, which was introduced by Einstein. We have here the introduction of a cosmological constant, which gives you the exponential expansion, but that enables you to squash down infinity to have this space-like infinity, which you can squash down to a finite boundary. What about the Big Bang? Can you stretch it out? Well, my colleague Paul Todd said this is a much nicer way of saying that the vial curvature, see, I was trying to say, well, quantum gravity in this funny way makes the vial curvature zero. Forget about quantum gravity. Maybe the vial curvature is zero. That's just a hypothesis. Paul Todd's way of saying it was, okay, let's say you can stretch out the Big Bang to make a nice finite boundary. That's fine. It's a very nice description that you can make both the infinity in the future and the Big Bang infinity of, of density in the past to make it a finite boundary. This is the crazy thing. This is my picture of conformal cyclic cosmology. The Big Bang had to be without any vial curvature because it was the continuation of the remote future squashed down of a previous eon. So each of these look, look like universes on the left. They're what I'm calling eons. The one in the middle, think of that, that's us. Our Big Bang stretched out becomes the squashed down remote finity, remote future of the previous eon. Our remote future becomes the Big Bang of the next eon. Is this something, just a crazy thought that you can't experimentally con Think about, well, you see there are signals that can get through. This is representing the join of one eon to the next. I'm thinking of light rays getting through. They certainly can in this picture. Can you see anything which gets through? What else could get through? Well, black hole collisions could get through. So the bottom picture, so in the middle picture, I have a surface that's meant to be the crossover between two eons. In the bottom half of this middle picture, we see black holes coming together, bang, 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 running into each other. The gravitational waves coming out. The top of the picture is us looking back to the stretched out Big Bang, and we will see these little rings, which are concentric rings coming from the big bang, bang, bangs like this. Well, do we see them? Well, this here is a picture of the Planck data. These two satellites, one was called the Planck satellite, and the earlier one was called the WMAP satellite. This is the Planck data from the Planck satellite. And my colleague, Vahe Gurzajan, plotted the centers of triple concentric rings of low variance. This is the prediction of the theory that you would get these. And the remarkable thing about this picture as, is that not only do you get this very clumpy distribution, which says something funny is going on, but you get them clumpy in the color too. Now, what does that mean? The red ones, the color coding tells you, according to the theory, that they're very, very distant, even outside what's called our particle horizon. The blue ones at the top are much closer. They're within our particle horizon, according to current cosmology. But they are super-duper clusters of galaxies or something. If you're going to explain this picture, you've got to have some theory which explains why the uh, universe is in this description, these are observations, complete just observations. You see this using a particular way of analyzing the data from the Planck data, and you see this very curious inhomogeneous distribution explained in the theory I've described by there being huge lumps of 
concentrations of materials in different places. And what about this? Now, this is the Hawking evaporation of a supermassive black hole. That's another, that's why I said I would get round to this. This is the Stephen Hawking's really most important contribution to the whole of the subject. And here we see a black hole evaporating away. We don't just get the Oppenheimer Snyder collapse. If you wait long enough, and it could be a huge length of time for the most, most uh, massive of the known galactic clusters, you expect supermassive black holes, which would take something like 10 to the 100 years or more than that. That's 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 100. So 10 to the 100 years, something like that, for them to descend, more than that, probably. And they disappear with a pop at the end. You see all the, all the mass of that black hole goes out in radiation. And you might say it's all lost. But in the conformal picture, it's not all lost. You see, this is a picture from a paper written by Christoph Meisner, Pavel Nirosky, and myself. Came out about uh, six months ago, or a little bit more than that, I think now. The bottom horizontal line represents the crossover, according to the theory. Now, maybe there's some other theory, but the crossover is the join between the previous eon and our eon. So that little point called H, that's what I'm called the Hawking point. Why I'm calling it the Hawking point? Well, because the little line leading up to it from below it is meant to be the history of a supermassive black hole. And all the radiation of it, remember the Escher fish, when they get close to the edge, it's all concentrated in a little tiny point. So the entire radiation from that supermassive black hole comes through in that little point. It now spreads out through the 380,000 years that James Peebles was talking about to the last scattering point or the decoupling point. It would be spread out to a radius of about eight times the diameter of the moon. And so we would, according to this theory, expect to see spots in the sky which are something like about um, 30 times or maybe 50 times the average variations of temperature in the cosmic microwave background. Do we see them? Yes, we do. We see several of them. We see at least six of them, which are seen in exactly the same places in both the W map and Planck data, in exactly the same points. Apparently, nobody has seen these spots before. Why? Probably because they've never looked, because they think that inflation eliminates these signals completely. But we see them, and in this paper, Christoph has this very clever way of doing the analysis, and the analysis tells us that these points are there with a 99.98% confidence level. So that's a very strong confidence level, that these spots are there. Exactly where they are, we don't have such a great confidence level, but the fact that these six points are seen both in exactly the same places in the W map and the Planck data, I think is strong reason to believe that those are actual Hawking points. I think this is an indication that a lot more study has got to be put into this. I'm not saying that these are necessarily actually Hawking points. I think they must be. I can't think of any other explanation. It's certainly not part of the, the inflationary picture. The inflationary picture should wipe these things out completely. I have no idea how it could be accommodated within conventional cosmology. I would be very intrigued to see an explanation for these spots in any other theory than the one I've been putting forward. So that's the story as it stands at the moment, with the singularities in black holes and the singularity at the Big Bang, and what is the nature of them and how do we understand singularities. It's a big question for the future. How does quantum mechanics combine with general relativity in the appropriate way? And I think these issues are things that we will be interested in and with confront science for many years to come. So thank you very much. It's been a great honor for me to be able to give this talk.
Okay, well, uh, thank you, Roger, for your fascinating lecture about black holes, and uh, apologies for the, the, the technical problems that we seem to be having at the moment um, in trying to get uh, Zoom to work properly. Um, now, remember, it's possible to ask questions about the lecture using the, uh, the, the Slido site. Um, so before we go to those questions, I thought I'd start by asking some questions that uh, occurred to me when I was listening to, to your lecture, Roger. Um, so what struck okay. me what struck me when you were uh, describing your um, singularity theorem was that uh, the way you described it was very visual. Um, and so I was wondering, was, was this the way that you discovered the theorem? Did, did you visualize how light rays emanating from a trapped surface would have to behave before you sat down and worked out the mathematics? Depends what you mean by mathematics. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly getting a feel for what boundaries of futures look like. You see, I'd worked out a lot of that from another problem I was thinking about, which had not to do with black holes at all. I was looking at um, a problem about asymptotic gravitational radiation, if you like. And I was had written a paper for the Royal Society, which actually came out almost at the same time as the black hole paper, because the black hole paper came out much more quickly because it's physical letters. But the other one was uh, about how zero rest mass fields, including gravitation, behave in the asymptotic limit. And one of the problems I ran into there was the shape. Of, if you have this geometrical way of looking at infinity, which was very useful in order to answer questions like what happens to, you know, very, what happens to gravitational radiation and what is radiation? And, they, and you like to go out to infinity. And usually people do this by complicated analytical procedures. And I much preferred to do a conformal transformation, which brings infinity into a finite place. You could just look at it. And the problem was whether infinity had the right sort of shape. I won't go into the details of that. But then I ran into a problem. And in order to solve this problem, it wasn't really important for the paper, but I really needed to clarify it for myself. And I put an appendix in this paper, which had to do with, roughly speaking, the shape of infinity. And the techniques I used for that were very much what I needed to use in the black hole problem. So I had these techniques more or less at hand. I didn't know quite how to use them in the black hole problem, but it's when I had the idea of a trapped surface, it did not take me long to realize that the boundary of the future of that trapped surface would be a compact region, and that there was some contradiction involved in mapping that back into the initial surface. So it was it was having that experience with my other paper, which gave me uh, the understanding I needed. Now, how much is that visual? Is your question? Well, it's a lot of it is visual. But to what extent is it's visual and analytic at the same time? I mean, you have to know what to trust in your visual pictures and what not to trust. So it's not uh, there's not a clear division between these things. But certainly, I think about things in a very visual way. That's certainly true. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, so the second uh, question is that your your theorem tells us that singularity formation is a, a robust prediction of general relativity, um, but to, <laughs> to, conclu to conclude that the singularities must lie inside black holes, you had to introduce your, your famous cosmic censorship conjecture. Um, I was wondering if you That's could correct. just say a few words um, in, in trying to describe that conjecture in, in general terms for our for our audience. Well, you see, in fact, the Nobel Committee was rather generous to me in a way, because my contribution did not actually tell you that black holes were a robust prediction. What it did say is that singularities are a robust prediction. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the thing is um, that I suppose the natural thing to expect is that these singularities are hidden in black holes, but it's not a theorem. It's not a mathematical conclusion that one can necessarily derive. And in a paper I wrote, which has a lot more in it than the paper that apparently got the Nobel Prize, there was one that I wrote for the Italian journal, um, and Nuova Cimento, who was a special issue of that, was just conference. But anyway, I did raise a lot of questions. And part of it was how you get energy out of black holes and things like that, the rotation of a black hole. But the question I raised right at the end was, do you, is there a theorem or some general principle which tells you that these singularities that you could see directly, a naked singularity, would be one from which information could come directly out of the singularity? and not being shielded from vision by the horizon. So anyway, you see it's not, the horizon is the clothes, and if it's naked, it doesn't have any clothes, you see. So it would really be cosmic censorship was the censoring that you didn't have these singularities you could directly see. Now, I, I was quite open-minded about that. And in fact, a paper I wrote later, I'd actually explore the possibility you might have naked singularities. And this was the one that read, led to the thing called the Penrose inequality, because it was a condition which showed that if you could violate this inequality, then you would have naked singularities. And I didn't prove that you couldn't violate it. That was the, I guess the Penrose inequality was a conjecture. I had not proved anything. It was curious because Stephen Hawking regarded it as a convincing argument that naked singularities didn't exist because I had failed to prove that they did exist or something like that. Excellent. Um, maybe I should uh, ask a question coming in from our, our audience. Um, so I have a question yeah. here from um, Sunak Chakraborty, who's in India, who asks, will an observer, okay. falling, in, fall, will an observer falling into a black hole be able to witness all future events in the universe outside the black hole? And the answer to that is no. I mean, if I just take the standard, uh, um, the standard Muffenheimer-Schneider <clears throat> um, model, which is virtually symmetrical, then you can see if you take one of these um, time-like curves, which end on the singularity, its past is a very definite region, and it certainly does not see the whole of the universe. It's a very explicit part of the universe, you see. And I would imagine that's the general case. So you would certainly not expect to see the whole of the future of the rest of the universe. No, no, very far from it. Okay. Um, another question uh, by uh, someone called Vicky from Hungary, who asks, can a black hole fully evaporate through Hawking radiation? If not, what is its long-term fate? <laughs> well, of course, there are unknowns about this, but my expectation is, yes, it would evaporate away. You see, the question is what happens at the very last moment, and I tend to call this the pop, which happens at the end, because it's relatively small. There is this uh, event when the last, uh, when the last um, moment of the black hole's existence, and it, the amount of radiation the intensity of the radiation increases as, as it gets smaller. It gets hotter, I should say. And it gets very, very hot and infinitely hot right at the end. But uh, I'm not, what, were, what was the question exactly? I can't quite remember the... Uh, the question was, can, can a black hole fully evaporate through Hawking radiation? So, Well, you said, I mean, yes would be the answer. Good. Of course, we, I mean, there's un, unknowns about how, how, what happens at the very last moment. And of course, you it expects at the very last moment your black hole has got down to maybe something like a Planck scale, which is a few grams, or 10 to the minus 5 grams, I should say. And, um, no, it's what, we're 10 to the 5th. I've got it the wrong way around. How many, how many grams is it? Is a Planck mass. Anyway, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's uh, quite small, um, but, but not infinitely small. But nevertheless, one can start questioning what happens at that point. But almost the entire black hole has disappeared by then, so why not the whole thing? Sure, the whole thing should probably disappear completely, yes. Into radiation. Yes. The radiation is there. Um, so um, we just mentioned Stephen Hawking, and we're celebrating Stephen Hawking's birthday today. 
so you were a collaborator of Stephen and, and a lifelong friend of his. So um, I just wanted to ask you about Stephen's most important contributions to physics. So, so in your talk, I think you mentioned Hawking radiation, and we just discussed that. And that this, this effect is such a big discovery that sometimes it, it tends to overshadow some of Stephen's other work on black holes. Uh, so I wondered if you could tell us briefly what yeah, you sorry, think. Did... Yeah, what, what, what do you think was Stephen's well, that was most, the most important, important thing. thing. Well, a clear formula for the entropy in the black hole, it's all part of the same problem. I mean, Ekenstein had a, a rather slightly hand-waving argument to suggest that the area of the black hole, the area of the horizon, was a measure of its entropy. And Stephen had a much clearer argument to show with, with a fa factor of a quarter, which go, told you more or less, well, exactly what one would expect for the entropy of a black hole. And I think that, that all goes along with his... Uh, the Hawking evaporation, Hawking radiation. So that's all one story, if you like. And I regard that as his most important contribution. He did do other significant things with black holes. One of them had to do with the uh, asymptotic behavior of a black hole. And when we're, I mean, we're thinking classically now, not, not to do with the Hawking evaporation. But you see, a black hole might be irregular I wouldn't expect it to be exactly like the Oppenheimer Schneider picture. It could be uh, with some irregularities, but it may very rapidly radiate away, and you end up with, well, the sort of thing you get is the Kerr solution, so it would be rotating, and that has a sort of stability about it. Now, the question was, is the Kerr solution uh, this, this limiting, or, or is it unique uh, as as the as the kind of stationary black hole that you could get at the end, and it was really Brandon Carter who started. Well, it was no. Go back a little bit more than that. It, it was it was Werner Israel, who, for the non-rotating case, he was looking at um, what what static configurations would you have with black holes, and, and it turns out to be the Schwarzschild solution, that all the other moments will raise. If there was a period of time when people believed that somehow that shows black holes what didn't exist, <laughs> because you, you could only have the spherical ones. So what happens to the unspherical ones? But the point is that they, all the irregularities get radiated away. The quadrupole, everything up to the quadrupole moment, including that, disappear in radiation, and you're left with just the the static Schwarzschild solution. But if it's rotating, then you can also have the, the Kerr solution. And there were Brandon Carter started this, uh, there were several people involved, uh, David Robinson and Stephen. You see, the thing is, the work before that was to show that if you had axis symmetry, then it had to be the Kerr solution. And what Stephen sh showed by a rather general argument, which is an ingenious argument, more or less showed that you, you had to have axis symmetry in the, in the limiting case. So that was an important contribution to this whole discussion. I guess that there was um, also... What else to do with black holes? No, sorry, go ahead. So, so there, there was the, um, the area theorem, um, or I guess was, was one of the... <laughs> well, there's a little bit of a question about that. <laughs> I mean, the story is there. I'm, I've never got, got the, to the root of it. I don't quite know what Stephen thought about it. You see, there was a story there. I was visiting Cambridge, and I remember having quite a long discussion with Stephen in one of the lecture rooms. And I was describing to him this general tendency for the area to increase, and that this was a general result. And uh, he, he didn't seem to know that at the time. I, I can't remember whether my paper was with, with Floyd was out by then or not, but certainly he, we'd done this work. And then um, I was staying in Cambridge, and the next morning I got a phone call from Stephen, and he said that the, the, this result we were talking about the previous night, he had an in interesting idea about it. And he said, oh, yes, what was that? Suppose you have two black holes, and they collide, and you can get from using the area, the fact that the area cannot decrease, is you get a limit on, on how much radiation comes out, something like that. And I remember that was a remarkable idea. And I said, I'd, I'd, I'd never thought of doing it that way. And how that you could think of the area of the black hole as being a composite of two different black holes together. So that was what he did. Now, his, his later memory of what happened was somehow that the... See, 
I mean, his memory was different from mine, you see, because I did talk about this theorem to him already the night before. But then he had he had this inspiration when he was waking up in the morning or something, I can't remember what it was. And that I took to be the fact that you could apply this result to a pair of black holes. And you could get a limit on how much radiation could come from a pair of black holes. But then it became this area theorem as he was starting with as his greatest contribution. And I got very puzzled about uh, Sorry, uh, let's let's stop this story and go on to the next question. <laughs> of course, that, that limit on how much gravitational radiation you can get is, is quite relevant now that we're, we're observing yes. uh, gravitational radiation from black hole mergers. Um, just uh, another very yes, quick... Yes, no, that's right. It would be relevant to that, yes. Yeah. yes. Another, another uh, very quick question <laughs> is, um, is there a maximum size limit for black holes? No, except there's a limit to how much matter there is in local regions in the universe, I suppose. No, there's no theoretical reason they can be as big as they like. I mean, you, can, you know, big ones can crash into each other and make even bigger ones. Depends on how much is available. I mean, if there's no matter around, you can't do much with it. Um, but there's no theoretical limit to the size of them. Uh, another very quick question, I think we've only got a, a minute or so left, is um, in your lecture, uh, I think you mentioned Paul Dirac and spinners. Um, I was interested because yes. Paul, Paul Dirac, a, a former Nobel Prize winner who, who discovered the equation governing the electron, he was at St. John's College in Indeed. Cambridge at the same time as you. So, so did you have any interactions with yes, Paul Dirac? Oh, yeah, quite an important one, you see. More than once, but the main one was, I remember being opposite him at dinner on one occasion, and I, I said I had some ideas that I wanted to discuss with him, and so I had a conversation with him in the lecture room about the spinner description, how you can write the curvatures in terms of spinners, and that I pointed out this equation that you have on the the vial spinner is this very symmetrical object and looks like a massive field, and and the question was, uh, could, was this any use for quantization? And he, his remark was, well, you have to have a Hamiltonian, you see. Well, that's just... No, he was very interested. because he, he gave a recommendation for me when I went to my job. I guess I had a job in the University of Texas. And they showed me the rec a recommendation that I had from Dirac. And it was very short, but it was <laughs> coming from Dirac. He said, you know, that, that he, it was based on this conversation where he said that I had done this interesting thing and it was all my idea that, that I developed. And I suppose that was um, a nice recommendation to get from a man like Dirac, certainly. Yes. But I've had other experiences with him too. Some of them not quite so good as that one. <laughs> <laughs> there was an occasion when he, he'd written, I'd written a review of his book, which is a very nice book, it's, very compact book, and he got something not quite right, you see. It was to do with whether the energy was localizable in a gravitational way. But well, actually, it isn't quite true. And he didn't normally talk to people, but I was at some reception, and I was one end of the room, and Dirac was at the other end of the room. And he saw me, and he came walking up to talk to me, and he complained about what I'd said in, in the recommendation. And I said, well, look, the... the the energy isn't localized in, in a gravitational wave, and I explained why. And then he went away again, so I guess he must have agreed with me at that point. <laughs> but he was somebody who didn't like to be wrong. So he said something which wasn't quite true in his book, which he did in this case. And I pointed it out in the review. And so, so I guess he felt a little uncomfortable about that. That was only a very, very minor point, but it wasn't what he said was not quite correct at all. Uh, every, everyone makes mistakes, even Nobel laureates, I guess. Oh, yeah, even Dirac. <laughs> Not often, but still. Yes. Uh, okay, well, well I'm, I'm, this has been really interesting, but I'm afraid that that's, that's all we have time for today. So um, thank you very much, Roger, for, uh, for answering our questions. Um, My pleasure. But personally, um, I must say I found Roger's your description of the history of you, to your Nobel Prize winning work in your lecture, absolutely fascinating. And I've also enjoyed greatly hearing your reminiscences of working with, with Stephen Hawking. So thank you again, Roger, for being with us this evening and letting us know about your um, exciting work on black holes. So I'm now going to hand back to Anne Davis. Thank you, Harvey.
And thank you, Roger. It's been such a privilege having you with us this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to apologize for the technical difficulty we experienced in the Q&A. Um, it's one of the consequences of lockdown, I'm sorry. Thank you, Roger. For me to thank the organizers of this meeting, the Center for Theoretical Cosmology at the University of Cambridge, our partners at LMU, and the amazing team at Intel Studios and Four Winds Creative for the incredible help with this live stream. It's been a great pleasure to also to work together with the Stephen Hawking Foundation, and we hope to be organizing lectures in honor of Stephen Hawking in the future as well. It just remains for me to say that if your questions were not answered, then our expert panel of young scientists will continue afterwards to address the issues that are important to you. If this live stream ends, then please follow the link that's shown on the screen now to see Haley introduce the panel. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned for future Hawking lectures. Good evening. Welcome everyone. So we've just enjoyed two lectures from leading figures in the study of black holes and the Big Bang. And they did get around to answering quite a few of your great questions, but it seems like there are just too many. So we're gonna to spend some time now going through some more of those questions. 
And we've got a fabulous panel here of young experts drawn from both Cambridge and Munich as a part of our strategic partnership between these two universities. So if you haven't asked your question yet, please head to slido.com and use the event code COSMOQ. And if you have already asked a question, please go and vote for the other great questions that you see, since we'll be answering the most popular questions first. So before we dive into the questions, let's briefly have each of our panel members introduce themselves. So up first, we have Mihalis. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michal Sagathos. I am a senior research uh, fellow at the University of Cambridge, and I'm working on the physics of gravitational waves. Thank you. And next we have Alex. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Bajera. I'm a researcher at the LMU University in Munich, and my research expertise is on the formation of galaxies and logical structure in the universe. Fabulous. And Angelo? Hello, I'm Angelo Caravano, and I'm a PhD student at the LMU University in Munich, and I work on the early universe physics, and in particular on the in first phase of expansions that is called the inflation. Thank you. And over to Fran. Hello, I'm Fran, and until very recently, I was a research fellow at the University of Cambridge, but I'm now an assistant professor at Durham University, and my research is on dark matter. Thank you. And Omar? Hi, uh, I'm Omar. I'm a PhD student in Cambridge, and uh, I specialize in uh, the gravitational lensing of the CMB. Thank you. Amelia? Hi, uh, I'm Amelia. I'm a research fellow at the University of Cambridge, and my research is primarily into cosmic strings. Fabulous. Elisa? Hello, my name is Elisa Ferreira. I'm a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, and my area of research is models of the early universe, dark matter, and dark energy. Thank you. Nico? Hi, my name is Nico Hamos. I work as a researcher in Munich. Uh, behind me, you can see the observatory where I usually work before the pandemic. And I'm interested in the largest structures in the universe and how to learn about cosmology from them. Fabulous. Over to Georgia. Hello, everybody. I'm Georgia, and I also work in the same pretty institute on the back of Nico, uh, together in the same group. And I, too, study the large-scale structure of the universe, uh, in particular, the very underdense structure in it. Fabulous. And last but not least, to Mirren. Hello, I'm Mirren. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, uh, and I work on modelling sources of gravitational waves uh, using supercomputers. Great, thank you so much. And I guess I should probably also introduce myself as well. Uh, my name's Haley. I'm a research fellow in Cambridge. And while I will be taking a back seat today and just directing the, the discussion, uh, my expertise lies in general relativity and cosmology as well. So thanks so much for all of your awesome questions on, um, on Slido. We've been keeping track and trying to think of our best answers. Uh, it's quite hard at times, but that, that, that means they're good questions, I guess. So. We're going to go first with the, the most popular question by, by quite a lot, which is from uh, Brum, who's a student at LMU. And unfortunately, I don't think they got around to answering this for, um, for Roger, who, to whom it was directed directly. But I think Fran said she was going to have a bit of a stab at this one. So the question is, uh, do you believe consciousness was already embedded in space-time in the beginning, or is it a consequence of fluctuations of the early universe? Hello. Um, I'm afraid my answer to this question might be somewhat unsatisfactory. I think that physics at the moment doesn't offer us uh, a way to understand consciousness or a theory of consciousness. Um, I know that, that Roger Penrose does have some ideas, but I'm not enough of an expert on them to really comment. Um, I think that the, the science that really has the, the most to say about consciousness would be neuroscience and Maybe one day that will link up with physics and we'll be able to say something. But I think that right now we are not at that point where we can really have a physics understanding of consciousness. 
Thanks, Fran. That's certainly a very tricky question, but I think you've done better than um, all of us could. So thank you so much. Um, okay, so next we're going to go to another question that's really highly voted that wasn't able to be answered by the speakers, unfortunately. So the question is from I, who is a student at TUM, and their question is, could it theoretically be that the Big Bang was actually a gigantic black hole which collapsed? So I think this was actually read out to Ichiro, but um, he, he kind of handballed it off to, to Roger, who I don't think got a chance to answer it. But luckily, Elisa has um, said that she's going to be able to give us a, a quick little response to this question. So go ahead. <laughs> Well, complicated question, like all the questions we have been seeing around. Um, so theoretically, there are models where people try to come up with a black hole that could somehow have given birth to the entire universe. There is a theory by Nyaya Shapchori from Perimeter Institute where they try to do that. So for some reason, there is an explosion of this black hole that creates all the matter. Um, it's very tough to get the results of this theory to match our exquisite observations that we have nowadays. So I would say that researchers are still working on to see if this is possible. But in general, black holes like uh, black hole, the singularity that you have in black holes, which are future singularities, are different than Big Bang singularities, with their, which are past singularities. So I would say like a white hole would be something more like a Big Bang uh, singularity. But I would say that nowadays we don't have, we have many theories that try to do it, but I would say that they're not uh, the most uh, accepted ones. So we keep trying, we keep trying. It's a good idea, but we have been failing until now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for that answer. Um, okay, so next we're gonna go on to a question from Anonymous. And this uh, question is probably best answered by Nico, I believe. So the question is, if the fastest thing in the universe is light, how is the universe larger than 13.8 billion light years in radius? Okay. Um, yeah, so there are sometimes confusions about sizes and ages. Um, so we know that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old because we see roughly the beginning of it, as Ichiro explained us. But... Um, the light that reaches us from there must not be the light from the edge of the universe. It can actually be, the, 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 the size of the universe can be much larger than that. It just means that the light from those regions has never reached us. It could reach us in the future. Um, so we don't actually know how big the entire universe is. It could be infinitely large. It could be closed in space and time, but this could be much larger than what we can observe ever in the future. So um, this is a difficult question to, to, to estimate the total size of the universe. I guess we just have to wait a little bit longer until we can see it, right? <laughs> Depends also on how fast the universe will expand. It could be that, you know, there will be a, a horizon um, in the future that we will never be able to cross. Uh, so the light will never reach us from there. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so our next question is uh, going to go to Alex, and the question is also from Anonymous, um, and the question is, when a photon gets redshifted due to the expansion of the universe, what happens to its lost energy? Yeah, Anonymous is asking really good um, questions. Um, let me try to answer this one. I'm not sure I have the most precise answer. I can at least share the, the simple way I, I, I like to answer it or or. or to think about this. So it's true, so the energy of a single photon is attached to its wavelength, and as the universe expands, the wavelength expands with it, and therefore the photon loses energy. So where does this energy go? So the simple way I think about this is, we can think about the energy going into the expansion of the universe. Why does this make some sense? Because if you now play the picture backwards, so now if instead of picturing an expanding universe, if you picture the universe contracting, now the photon will be regaining the energy that was previously given to the um, expansion. So it's not necessarily the case if this is where the question was, was having, that energy is being lost. So energy conservation still has a chance uh, as being one of the most fundamental laws we have in the universe. Uh, if you think about it, this transmission of energy from the photons to the expansion of the universe. Great, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so next our, our question is from Robin Bold in the UK, specifically in Bristol. 
And their question is going to go to Angelo. And the question is, good evening, very polite, Robin. What is beyond the edge of the universe as it expands, i.e. what is in front of the edge of space it expands into? Hello. Thanks for this question. I really like this question because it's, of course, the first thing that everybody, when uh, when think about the expansion of the universe, me first, when I learned that the universe is expanding, meaning that if we observe a galaxy far away, we see that th this galaxy is going, it's, it's uh, receding from us. And so we learn that the universe is expanding. And the first thing, if I'm managing the universe in my head, then I'm, I imagine the universe expanding into something. But this is actually misleading because that's just the lack of our imagination. The, the real problem here is that space itself is, is a concept that is within our universe. So uh, it's a kind of a similar question that we have to what happened uh, before the Big Bang in time. It's kind of the same question because the, the whole idea of time and space themselves are within the universe and within the universe. So uh, this is a bit of a tricky question. Then there's also the thing, uh, of course, the universe is expanding. We are going to see more and more things and the universe is expanding. Is this going to stop and what's beyond this? So this is a kind of a simpler way of seeing this problem. And the answer to this question is that we don't know. For Because from the beginning of the universe, we can observe only a portion of the universe so far because the universe is a finite age. And uh, the more time it passes, the more things we can see, but we don't know what's what's beyond. And we will never uh, know, uh, yeah, and definitely what's beyond our edge or what we can see in the universe. Awesome. Thanks so much. Unfortunately, there is a lot of we don't know in our field. So I'm sorry if that's not a satisfactory answer, but that's all we got. But that, that was really yes, great. Um, Ali, I, once I uh, um, heard someone saying, so... Okay, if one like really wants to uh, think about like what the universe expanded into, one thing that one could think is uh, you know like the universe is like expanding expanding into the time, you know. So if one wants to uh, like this was something that I have someone uh, want say uh, yeah like yeah if you want to think about this expansion of the universe. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you, Emma. Um, okay, so the, the next highest rated question is asking about where we where you can get one of those CMB globes that Ichiro was holding by Paul. I have absolutely no idea, so I would just suggest that you Google it maybe, and I don't think anyone else here really knows, or shoot Ichiro an email and ask him, I guess, maybe. <laughs> but um, otherwise, I think we're just going to move on. So the, um, the next question I think is one that I'm just going to probably answer, answer quickly, which is from Arnav Vent... Uh, Venkatesh in India. And the question is, why does time seem to flow only in one direction? Why won't it naturally travel back in time or to the future, just like black holes are formed naturally? This is, I mean, this is a really tricky question. And this is something that physics can't really answer because our own perception of time is not really, um, is, is not really described by physics. And although Elisa is actually saying she wants to add something. So Elisa, would you like to yeah, I agree with you. This is like a question that has been on the minds of physicists uh, since the beginning. Um, like Haley said, we don't know. There is no um, definitive answer to this one. But some physicists think that maybe this idea of time flow is linked to entropy. So uh, usually in all the physics that we see, uh, we see that they have symmetries for example you can go uh, you can walk uh, toward like in front of you and back you can go but not time uh, there is only one law that kind of has some also a direction which is the second law of thermodynamics that says that uh, entropy can only increase so some physicists think that maybe the time is linked to entropy um, and that, that that this perception of time only going forwards is linked to um, entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, again, some physicists disagree. They call this um, thermodynamic um, thermodynamic time something that should not hold. Uh, so it's an open question, and maybe a linked question to this one is. Is time fundamental or is time an emergent concept? And maybe if you answer one of those questions, you know the others. So 
that is an open question. Please join physics and help us think about this. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the short of it is we need help, really. <laughs> but we can also always answer questions with more questions. But thank you so much for that, Elisa. That's awesome. Um, okay, so the next one that we're going to answer is from Lily. And we've got two of our panel members who really want to have their say on this one. So thank you for your question, Lily. The question is, where, in your opinion, does physics need to go next? What is the biggest problem facing the next generation of physicists, which I guess is us and our audience as well? <laughs> so first, we're going to go over to Amelia. Yeah, hi. So um, I think I'm just going to answer the first bit of that. Um, and at the moment, a really fruitful area of cosmology is um, the detection, studying, the, studying gravitational waves, um, which have been detected recently from black holes, um, which a couple of other panelists also might want to talk about. Um, but I really think this is a very important area to be looking into at the moment. Um, primarily, well, we've heard quite a lot about the Big Bang in the public lectures and how, you know, we can't see past the last scattering surface of the cosmic microwave background. But actually, because gravitational waves interact um, so weakly with matter, it means that actually they might provide a window to see even back in the, even further back in the history of our universe than the photons from the microwave background. So um, to me, that's a really exciting area that we should be pursuing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amelia. And uh, Georgia as well wanted to say something about this. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, this is a very open question. There are so many things in physics that we still don't know. We, as we, it was just, uh, as we just saw by, you know, here by the, by us struggling answering some of these questions. But um, I guess I, I just, uh, as as a cosmologist, let, uh, let's say what bo bothers me the most is still that we don't understand the 95% of what uh, our universe is made of, which as uh, was summarized multiple times during our workshop and during the lectures that just aired. So uh, yeah, I guess at least it, it should be uh, something that is addressed in the near future what the colder matter part uh, is uh, for our model. And, and although, to be honest, I, I, I'm more concerned about, you know, what lambda is. This is something that I think we really don't understand at all. So in summarizing, I really would like to see uh, in the future what lambda CDM, which is our um, concordance model, is a is a, an approximation for. So I would like to see the real deal, let's say. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm sure we've all got insights on this question, but we're, we're gonna keep, keep moving along for now. So thanks guys for that one. Um, so next we, we have a question um, about, about black holes leading into other universes. So we're going to go to Mirren for an answer on this one, his insight onto that. So the question is from Tom H. And the, the question is, do you think black holes lead into other universes? Um, so I guess with this question, uh, of course, we don't know. And um, if we went into a black hole, hole, uh, we went past, you know, into the event horizon, we'd never be able to tell anyone outside of a black hole because a black hole is, is defined by, you know, having no communication with, with the outside. Uh, but even when you were in black hole, what, what is your kind of ultimate fate? Where do you go once you're in a black hole? Well, the only place you can go is, is to the singularity. That, that's, that's the, the, your, you will always go there if you go into a black hole. That's, that, that is where you always go. Um, so, can, can you access other universes if you go into a black hole? The answer is, I mean, of course we don't know, but the answer is if we, you know, if we believe our current picture, then the answer is no. But, but like I said, we, we really have no idea what's, uh, what's, what's in a black hole. Uh, do I believe it's possible that, you know, maybe there are universes through a black hole? I mean, maybe, sure. But yeah, I don't know is the answer to this question. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have a we had a question from um, Joe, which disappeared from our slider window, but we can still see it. So this is a gravitational wave question. So we're going to our resident gravitational wave expert, Mahalis. So the question is: Can gravitational waves reflect 
reflect, refract, and diffract like other waves? If so, how does that work? Oh, brilliant. So, so yeah, the diffraction of uh, and so on. Uh, so, what, the, what you're referring to is a set of phenomena that are familiar to us from interactions of light and other types of waves with matter. So, the question now is, you know, do gravitational waves interact with matter the same way that other types of waves do? And the, and the answer is partly yes, uh, partly no. So, that, there are some qualitative differences. Um, the, the main thing is that gravitational waves uh, interact very, very weakly with uh, any sort of matter. So, you need a lot of matter that is, that is condensed into a very small region. Um, that, that, so it's, it's so weak that, you know, we, we can actually see gravitational waves coming from the very center of supernova explosions, or, or the, the first billionth of the billionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. So, so this is how, how, how uh, weakly gravitational waves interact with matter. So, you know, another thing is, before they actually interact with, with huge bulks of, of matter uh, that are very massive, and another way that we can get uh, wave effects, uh, like the ones that you mentioned, on gravitational waves is through, uh, th through gravity. So gravity, a gravitational well that is created by massive objects, it can itself uh, be used as a lens. It can, can cause uh, the paths of, of gravitational waves and light to bend. So this is the main thing that we expect gravitational waves to, to, to go through when they meet such you know, very, very uh, dense regions of, uh, of matter. And the other final qualitative difference of gravitational waves is that they actually self-interact. So gravitational waves also interact with themselves. And this is kind of, this makes the, 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 the situation a bit more tricky, especially when you are in a, a strong, strong gravity regime. So yeah, overall, uh, you'd expect the wave effects to, to happen on gravitational waves, but not in exactly the same way as you do with light, for example. Awesome, thanks so much, that's super interesting. Uh, so next, we're going to go to a very tricky question <laughs> that none of us really uh, wanted to answer, but we're going to go ahead anyway. So the, que the question is from Abhinav Chowdhury, and it is, what was the view of Stephen Hawking on string theory? And Fran has very uh, lovely decided to say something about this. Let's go ahead. Hello. Um, so in terms of what Stephen Hawking's view was, I know that he used concepts from st of string theory in some of his work, but beyond that, I, I wouldn't want to put words into his mouth in saying what his view was on the matter. I can tell you more broadly that string theory is probably the most popular theory among theoretical physicists that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity, which is a very important goal, but the research on string theory is still really ongoing in particular to try to make contact between string theory and observations that we can actually make of the universe. So there's still lots more work to be done. Awesome, thank you so much, Fran. Uh, okay, so, the next one we have is um, is from Chris Crow in Cambridge, and the question is: Given the CMB B mode polarization is yet to be discovered and is probably below galactic dust and synchrotron emission, will we ever prove cosmological inflation? Does anyone want to take this one? We're, we're kind of we're running a bit empty here. I'm going to pick someone at random. <laughs> I, I can talk if you want. Thank you, Angelo. Take it away. So uh, you're right that that could be, or maybe the possibility that the um, that the inflation generated this B mode polarization in the uh, in the CMB that they are too weak to be to be observed. And in that case, I wouldn't know what's the answer. But I know that I mean the. Um, there, um, we still don't know this, and researchers are still uh, looking for it, for this uh, B-mode polarization wave. And, and there are still uh, other ways in which we could observe consequences from what happening to, to inflation in other ways that comes, for example, um, for the phases just af after inflation. So uh, th there's quite a hope that inflation, the on that, that, that B-mode polarization are not the only uh, proof that inflation happened, and so, but there's no current 
I estimate if we uh, end agreement in science, if really the, if if the if they are too small, like what you say that they are probably too small, it's not something that that all the scientific community agree. That's why we're still looking for it. Great, thanks, Angelo. And I think Elisa had something she wanted to add to that. Yeah, I want to add something that since I sure gave this uh, wonderful talk before we uh, we had this Q and A, it was involved in a project called uh, Lightbird, which is one of the leading projects that is the goal is to detect gravitational waves, um, primordial gravitational waves. So be tuned to uh, around. At 2030s, <laughs> when this telescope is going to be released. I just wanted to add something. Um, so if you discover gravitational waves, you're not necessarily uh, proving inflation because uh, there are alternative models or even thousands of models within inflation that can generate the same gravitational wave signal. So I guess not all researchers agree with what, what I just said, but I would say half and half uh, think that if you seek primordial gravitational waves, uh, and again, primordial are the ones that would come either from inflation or, or alternative to inflation, alternative explanations for the early universe, um, and half of the researchers think that this would not falsify inflation. So it is also a big debate in the community, a fun one. Great, thanks so much for your insight, guys. Um, okay, so next we have a question from another anonymous, and that question is gonna to go to Fran, and it is, why is it hard to collect information about dark matter? This is a great question. So dark matter, we have only detected so far gravitationally. All the evidence for dark matter is because we can see its gravitational pull on other matter. And it might be that dark matter doesn't have any other kinds of interactions apart from gravity. And then we simply wouldn't be able to detect it any other way. This would make me very sad, of course. So I'm hoping that dark matter does interact very weakly with the standard model particles. So those are the particles that we're made of and include things like photons, particles of light. Now, if dark matter interacts very weakly with photons, for example, then we might be able to detect these very weak interactions by making very sensitive measurements with very large detectors. But because dark matter's interactions are so weak, we need to come up with really powerful detectors to find this evidence for dark matter. And that's why it's so difficult, because it interacts so weakly with the particles that we're made of and can see. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Fran. And uh, Omar wanted to add something to that as well. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I wanted to add, to add something uh, uh, to what Fran uh, said before. So she said that, yeah, that dark matter interacts gravitationally. And uh, one thing is, actually, if you want, you can go online and uh, look for maps uh, of uh, the dark matter. So this is because uh, uh, the CMB photons are also affected by the, uh, the dark matter in the universe. And so people, uh, uh, particularly me also, we were able to create uh, these maps uh, of uh, the uh, dark matter that if you go online, like go like to the ACT experiment uh, website, you can find these maps of like dark matter. So in some sense, you can already see dark matter just by your eyes, if you want. Great, thanks so much for that. All right, so we're moving on to yet another question from Anonymous as well. So the question is, is it possible there are multiple universes? This is a big question and Nico is gonna answer it completely for us. <laughs> Thank you, uh, I'm not gonna answer anything about it really, but um, this is of course a question that has been thought about long ago and actually, um, the inflationary theory that um, Roger told us about as well um, has a natural consequence that you would expect many different universes to, to appear out of it. Um, the problem is we might never be able to observe any of those. And um, the other problem is there might be infinite, infinitely many of them and they can be very diverse and different. They could have totally different laws of physics so it's, it's rather difficult to make quantitative statements and it's even sometimes argued whether this is still uh, in the domain of physics or uh, probably philosophy. Uh, so it's still an active 
topic of research and, and people are fighting about the interpretability about the multiverse. And I'm sure also others in this panel have um, knowledge on the more latest uh, evol evol evolvements of this. Great, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so next we're gonna go to a question from Garth W. And this question is gonna go to Amelia. And it is, what is the hard evidence for dark matter and dark energy? Isn't this a manifestation of the failure of current theories? Bit of a stab there, but go ahead, Amelia. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think um, the kind of aim behind this question is to try and put it more, in, try and put dark energy and dark matter more in the context of what our current theories are. Um, and this person said, is it a failure, is it a manifestation of a failure of the current theories? Well, that's sort of, if you want to look at it that way, in a way, I mean, we can only describe 5% of our universe with like matter that we know of. Um, and it's right to say that as Fran was talking about before, as dark matter only interacts gravitationally, that's the only sort of indirect way that we've been able to see it. Um, we haven't d detected it directly yet, um, but both of these areas are ongoing areas of research in physics at the moment. Um, and they're very much sort of, um, so uh, there's lots of different theories of dark matter, lots of different theories of um, sort of contesting theories that um, sort of go, you know, contest um, dark energy. So there's um, lots of other, um, other theoretical models for these things as well. Um, it's very much an open question at the moment. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Alex wanted to add something to this question, actually. So go ahead, Alex. Yeah, this was a particularly insight, insightful question, I find, because it gives me the chance to underline something that's actually important and something that was mentioned already, was that we only have gravitational evidence for both dark matter and dark energy. And this has led many people to think about, okay, maybe these things are just uh, manifestations of well, the five theories of gravity, as we call them, which means theories of gravity beyond uh, general um, Einstein's theory of general um, relativity. This is actually a very active field uh, of research in the, in the cosmological um, community. Uh, the current status quo is that, amazingly, GR, general relativity, keeps surviving all of the tests. But, um, yeah, this is a question we should always keep in mind. Whenever we have to postulate something that looks weird, it's helpful to at least you know take a breath and ask okay could it be something wrong going on with our assumptions on other parts of, um, of our understanding of the universe yeah thanks for adding that that's a super important part of science is to is to remain skeptical even if it's in our own assumptions so thanks for adding that um, the next uh, top question that we have on Slido is, again, from I, the student at TUM, but I think Miranol already touched on this earlier. So the question was about what is um, what is inside black holes. And I'm really sorry, I, but the short of it is we have no idea. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to move on from this one um, to, to the next question from Kim. Uh, and that question is, if energy is equal to mass, does that mean that the loss of the sun would have no immediate gravitational effect until we lose sight of its light? That's a great question, and Alex wants to answer this one. Yeah, I think the answer to that question is positive. We will, so if the sun automatically disappears, let's say, let's let's pretend that will happen, we will only, so we will only feel its gravitational absence at the same time we would feel its uh, electromagnetic absence. So, the, um, and this is a consequence not so much as the fact that energy is equal to, to mass, but rather the fact that light and gravitational waves travel at the same speed. This is a prediction of general relativity, and more and more time, it was um, proved true very recently by a detection, a simultaneous detection. This was this was an, an amazing detection of um, a simultaneous detection of the gravitational wave signal at the light emitted by two uh, neutron um, stars. This was um, this proved that gravitational waves travel at the same speed as as light and was one more um, chapter in the success story of general um, relativity. One chapter of many. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so our next question is from Martin from Sheffield, and it's a fabulous question, and Mirren wants to give it a stab. So that question is, what is a singularity? Uh, so, I mean, quite simply, a singularity uh, in the theory of general relativity is just where 
where mathematically where the equations uh, you know you get infinities where where it doesn't really make sense anymore um what i should say though is that i mean you might say well what really is it what well, you know that's just the mathematics what, what's actually happening there and of course the answer to that is is we don't know um our current understanding is that you know well our current guess is that we're probably going to have to resort to some you know theories of quantum gravity uh, to, to resolve what really happens uh, within, within a black hole, which is where we expect these singularities to be. Um, but, of course, we don't know. And, um, yeah, just to stress that point that, that um, uh, Penrose's, uh, Roger Penrose's weak cosmic censorship conjecture is actually why we believe, uh, it's, it's a conjecture, but it's why we believe that um, all singularities lie within black holes. You can't have any naked singularities just in the universe, you know, random infinite infinite density points um but yeah we don't really know to be sure no that's great thanks so much Mirren. so our next question is from swapnel and this question is what books do you recommend for studying cosmology so one for our next generation of budding cosmologists so nico has some recommendations first uh, i guess there's a very, a very obvious answer and that would be the brief history of time uh, but of course, it depends on what level you want to study cosmology. So, but this was really the one book that inspired me myself very uh, much to go on and uh, do what I did, study physics and, and continue. But um, um, if you really want to go into the nitty gritty details of cosmology, then I would recommend you textbooks of uh, modern textbooks of cosmology. For example, the one by Slava Mukhanov uh, is the one that I used for my studies, and I really like it. And I, th I think uh, others have other recommendations here. Yes, awesome. I think uh, Omar wanted to add something as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to add one book because it's related to a Cambridge person that um, passed away this year. And he's like John Barrow. And he wrote a fantastic uh, uh, pop science book. It's called The Book of Universes. And I think that Everybody will love this book. It's a great book uh, that, uh, you know, like talk about cosmology, science, uh, math, uh, and yeah, so uh, check, check it out. Awesome. Thank you so much for those recommendations, guys. I'm sure that'll help get some people on the right track. So after that one, our, our next question comes again from Anonymous, and it is, how much energy is radiated away in gravitational waves in the very early universe? And again, we're going to go to our resident gravitational wave expert, Mihalis. Hi, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I actually wanted to, to also suggest a book on cosmology, which is by Scott Dodelson. Um, I think the, the name of the book is More Than Cosmology. Um, that was very helpful for me when I was studying. So, so yeah, um, uh, from the early universe, uh, the, the answer is we'll probably get a lot of energy, like humongous amounts of energy in uh, gravitational waves in the early universe. But it's it's very difficult to kind of um, imagine um, to quantify this in terms of in terms of an expanding universe. So the, the best thing we can do is to to today to try to measure how much of this uh, propagates to us in the same way that the cosmic microwave background propagates to us. Uh, so we, we are searching for this kind of backgrounds. We call them the stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds uh, of cosmological origin. And um, the fact that we haven't observed such a thing, uh, so this, this would appear in our detectors as a kind of noisy, humming uh, background that we could not explain in any other means. Uh, and the fact that we have not seen such a thing yet means that we can place uh, an upper bound on the, on the quantity of gravitational waves uh, in, in such a such a stochastic background from the early universe, and the way that that people like to measure things coming from the early universe, to measure kind of uh, uh, not not energies, because of course if if the universe is uh, is infinite, then the energy would also be infinite. But but energy densities, let's say, in the current um, universe, uh, is by comparing the energy density of this uh, gravitational wave background to the, what we call the critical density, so the energy density that you need to, uh, for, to, to close the universe in, in some sense, to make it kind of um, uh, uh, collapse onto itself in, in, in a way, as a geometry. I mean. uh, so the more, the more energy you have concentrated um, per unit volume, the, 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 the more likely it is that the universe is closed. 
And so when you compare it with this critical uh, density, then the latest bounds give, give you that um, the amount of gravitational wave energy density uh, in the current universe is an extremely small fraction of this, uh, of this uh, critical density. I think it's uh, 10 to the minus 6 or 7. Uh, I, I can't remember it from the top of my head, but yeah. So maybe a cosmologist can, can chip in and, and uh, maybe comment on what amount this, this energy would uh, relate to in the early universe. Good question. Any takers for that? I mean, in cosmology, we measure uh, for the from the CMB, we measure the R, like the so-called like R parameter, like this, like the amplitude uh, of the uh, like tensor, uh, like gravitational uh, perturbation over uh, like the scalar ones, uh, and this much smaller than uh, than the like the perturbation that you see like the temperature map of the yeah. Great, thanks, Omar. All right, so uh, our next question is from S, and it is, if we can't see the beginning of the universe, how do we know the universe even started at all? What if it always existed? And this is a really, really good question, and it's another uh, really active area of research. And, of course, as we've heard from a few people now, there is only a certain distance back um, that we can actually see back in time, and we might be able to see further with gravitational waves, but this is, a, like, there are a lot of alternate theories of how the universe started, and there's a lot of theories on bouncing cosmologies and um, other cyclic universe theories that don't necessarily have a single start of the universe. So uh, I'm, I don't know much about these theories or how they're going to be maybe uh, proved right or wrong one day, but at the moment our leading theory of the start of the universe is that it started with a singularity. Um, but that's about all we've got to say on that one at the moment. Uh, but Nico actually wants to add something. So, Nico, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to say that it's true that we cannot see through this um, miso soup that Ichiro uh, <laughs> explained. But we do see things that have been created before then. For example, the elements, uh, helium, um, we see in a high abundance in the universe. And they are not formed in stars because we don't have enough stars to efficiently form so much helium. So that's one of the observables or remnants from, from the earlier time of uh, before we can actually look through the miso soup where there was already a higher temperature. So the universe must even be have, have been higher, higher temperature and smaller in size at that time. But of course, we will never get to the very beginning um, with this. Great, thank you so much for that, Nico. Uh, okay, so our next question is from David, and this question is, if dark matter dominates the universe, equations show that the total energy of the universe is not conserved, it is increasing. How? Fran, please tell us. Yeah, so this is a, a great question, and I think something that confuses a lot of people. Uh, I think probably... What uh, the question should say is in a dark energy dominated universe, equations show that the energy of the universe is increasing. So dark energy is a very special kind of, of substance that we think we think exists throughout the universe where the energy density remains constant as the universe expands. So you might think, well, this means that the total energy is increasing. But this is actually uh, a bit misleading because within the theory of general relativity, there isn't a good way of defining the global energy of the universe, the energy in the whole universe. So in that sense, it can be true that energy needn't be conserved globally, but that doesn't mean that locally in kind of small regions, energy conservation doesn't hold. That still very much does hold. It's also possible, as I think someone mentioned earlier, to think about the work being done by the expansion of space as kind of generating the energy for, for dark energy. So that's one way you can think about it. But I think the more fundamental answer is that global energy just isn't well defined within general relativity. Great, thank you so much for that explanation. That's definitely made it a lot clearer, I hope. 
Um, okay, so next we're going to jump down the list a little bit and we're going to answer a really interesting question from Robin. And Georgia wants to give this question a stab. So it is, what theory has the best chance of becoming the theory of everything? Quantum loop gravity or string theory or something else? What do you think, Georgia? Yeah, again, I think probably the honest question is that, again, we don't really know. But uh, I like this question because it was, I don't know, it felt like um, it was a bit, uh, I, I felt like being in the Big uh, Big Bang Theory, the show, so I, I wanted to, to address this a little bit. I think I, let's say my hope, uh, or what I think uh, probably will happen, just um, in my opinion, uh, is that probably none of these two um, theories that were mentioned but probably something else uh, that we we still haven't thought of. So if we think about the past, GR, for example, was uh, you know became uh, important as it is today because it solved the problem. And as far as I'm aware of, so we didn't know how the orbit of Mercury. We didn't know how to predict it. We couldn't explain it before GR, for example. And so far, these other uh, two theories, they're very elegant. Uh, they're, they have nice pre predictions, so especially quantum loop gravity, from what I know. Uh, but they don't really solve any of the problem that I'm aware of. They don't solve any of any pro of the big problems that we have. So uh, what I hope is that we will, come with, we will come up with something else that will solve everything. <laughs> Again, we're just putting the pressure on to the future generation of scientists. Exactly. <laughs> it's always fine. Someone else will do it. Okay. <laughs> so our next question, um, coming towards the end, unfortunately. Our next question is from Anonymous, and Mirren's going to answer this one for us. And the question is, do you think that white holes or the counterparts of black holes exist? Um, okay, so I guess the very short answer to this question is 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 not in this universe, uh, and this kind of goes back to the the question I asked I was asked before, which is a what 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 do you see if you go through a black hole? Can you get to get to other universes? And actually, mathematically, uh, there's certain types of black holes you you can look at, and if if you were able to travel, you know, faster than the speed of light, obviously that's not possible, and go through a black hole, um, then then you'd come out of a white hole in perhaps another universe, um, but but in this universe, I, I I don't think I don't think we can expect to see. We don't have the same kind of you know, uh, for example, Penrose's singularity theorem, for which he won the Nobel Prize, that predicts black holes. We don't have that kind of same uh, uh, prediction of, of white holes uh, here. Great, thank you so much, Mirren. Now, there's still, there are so many questions on Slido. We would literally be here all night. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't stick around for too much longer. So we're going to go to our final question for the evening. And that question is from Taylor. And the question is, have black holes had any influence on our planet? And Amelia wants to say something about this. Yeah, so I wanted to say a couple of things about this. Um, the first thing is that we know that there's a supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way. So this obviously to an extent determines how we move through the universe in its gravitational field. Um, but more recently relevant is um, we've, as I've already mentioned, um, detected the gravitational waves from binary black hole mergers. So you could say that that's an effect on our universe um, because we're detecting it. So it's obviously affecting our detectors in that way. Um, so, yeah, they're the main two things I would say about that. Can I, can I very quickly jump in? Just in the yeah, so, yeah, so there's, this, there's a mysterious object at the outskirts of our solar system. And uh, it goes under the name Planet Nine, I think, so, or Planet X, I think Planet Nine. And people have, still haven't figured out what it is. People, people think that it's there because it's affecting things. Uh, it's affecting orbits in our solar system. Uh, but but the people don't know still what it is. And there, are, there is, of course, one of the theories that is kind of speculative, that this may be a, a black hole, a small, tiny black hole kind of object. But of course, you know, it, it, these are, this is a, an extreme uh, kind of scenario that needs uh, extraordinary evidence if we want to believe in it. But it's still an open hypothesis. So maybe black holes have uh, influenced the, the Earth in, in more than gross ways. Great. Thank you so much. And what a great way to end it. 
So that's all we have time for, unfortunately. There are so many more questions that we would love to stick around and keep answering. Um, so I'm sorry if we didn't get around to your question, but thank you so much for all of those amazing questions that you did submit. And uh, a huge thanks to all of our fantastic panel members for their great answers and for hanging out with us tonight. We've had so much fun answering all your questions. And we've also just opened a survey on Slido so you can let us know what you thought of the event. So please give us any feedback you may have or, or just let us know how much fun you had tonight. And we'll leave that survey open for the rest of the evening. And just before we sign off, we'd also like to thank the organizers at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology in Cambridge and our partners at LMU in Munich. And also a big thank you to the media teams from Intel Studios and Four Winds Creative. They've all been fantastic and we definitely couldn't have done this without all of you. And it's been really great working with the Stephen Hawking Foundation as well. And we've had so much fun tonight and we really hope we'll be able to do this again in the future. So thanks so much and good night. Thank you.